Hello, high side, low side audience. I am Spurgeon Dunbar. I'm joined, of course, as always, by my co-host, Zachary Quartz. And we have one heck of an episode for you in store here. This is episode four of season six. Uh, In our Not the News segment today, we're going to be talking about Norton. There are some new owners there. We're going to then move on to the meat and potatoes of the discussion, which today is going to be all about bad moto purchases. We are joined by Andy Greaser, our staff writer for Common Tread, and he's going to stick around for the Rev Trivia Motorcycle Engine Sound Guessing Game. We're then going to give away a t-shirt for those of you brave enough to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And as always, we're going to close out the episode with addressing some comments that you have sent in via email or have left on our YouTube channel. But before we do any of that, let's get in a word from our sponsor, Motul. Yes, indeed. If you go to revzilla.com slash Motul, you'll see all manner of products. You'll see coolant, oil, chain clean, uh, chain wax, chain lube, um, what else? Helmet cleaner, all kinds of things to keep you and your motorcycle up and running smoothly. If you go to the top of the page there, you'll see a Motul logo alongside a high side, low side logo. And that's because Motul has sponsored high side, low side for almost as long as any of us can remember. So we very much appreciate Motul sponsorship. And uh, if you would like to support high side, low side, the next time you or your motorcycle needs some maintenance, you can go to revzilla.com slash Motul. That's revzilla.com slash M-O-T-U-L. So we are back for yet another episode of (laughs) America's favorite motorcycling podcast. How have things been in your world, Mr. Quartz, since I've talked to you last? Oh, we're just we're struggling with the heat wave here, just like so many other places in the world. So we're, we're trying to stay cool here in, in Los Angeles. Uh, but other than that, things are whipping right along. I heard, though, not to change the subject too quickly here, did did you not participate in your first enduro? I did. Recently, yes. Spurgeon Dunbar. I did. So uh, I did a... Uh, uh, a timekeeping enduro here in New Jersey for the East Coast Enduro Association. I did Mm -hmm. the Beehive Enduro. And and fun fact, Revzilla actually sponsors the uh, the entire East Coast Enduro Association uh, series. So Well, now, I, what a terrific company. Yeah, I wanted to get out and I wanted to kind of participate <laughs> in this. And it's something that uh, one Mr. Jeff Canary, who is a, a friend that sometimes makes appearances um, mm-hmm. in Common Tread articles, and he, uh, he got me out there and got me to do it. And Brandon actually raced as well. So Brandon, I think, came in fifth or sixth in his class. Jeff came in sixth in his class. I didn't do as well. I was in the top 20 in my class. Uh, <laughs> but I will say this. I, I went in without any kind of uh, goals, right? I just wanted to go and have fun and, and see what it was like. Sure. And after after the first test, I was like passing people. I was like, huh, okay. Nice, I, nice. I like this. And then the second test, I was passing people. And then halfway, at the end of the second test, I was, I was getting passed because I made some mistakes and I was struggling a little bit. But <laughs> all things considered, it's addictive. I can understand... What all the hoopla is about when people right. are actually talking about racing? Because I'll tell right. you what, like I'm already like looking at the calendar to see when I can go again, and I can do better than that. I can do better than that is you know right. what's going through your head. So it's like sort of a large. I've never done an enduro, but I've I've competed on uh, a number of different levels in sports in my life, and I feel like it's one of those. It's like a, a, a motorcycle racing specifically is kind of like a large adult version of the carnival game where you do, you know, like a ring toss or whatever. And as soon as you get done with it, you're like, I can do better than that. I can do better than that. I just got to like, if I just get my, if I just get my head in, I can do better than that. Um, And that's, that's how they get you. You just keep coming back and paying your entry fee and doing the thing. That's funny. I'm I'm excited for you. I've heard you and Ari talk so much about like the road racing side of things. Right. And like Ari talks about like the red mist and like you get out there and you're really just (laughs) like, you're in the zone. And I'll be honest with you. Like I, (laughs) I've always been very much the, 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 the type of like, oh, like, I, I'm not competitive. Like, you can go ahead in front of me. It's fine. And there was one point where um, I there was a guy stuck on the trail, and I went to, like, go around him and be super aggressive, and then I got caught on a stump, and then I, like, fell over on the bike. And I looked up, and I was like, hey, man, like, don't wait for me. I'll, I'll, I'm good. I'll go. And he just looked down, and he's like, I wasn't planning on waiting for you, man. And he took off. And, and you realize, like, I'm coming into it with a mindset of, like, you know, like an adventure event or a dual sport, like you're not out there for blood, you're out there just helping people through. And all of a sudden, like your mindset changes really <laughs> quickly. And I found myself, I, I found myself being very surprised at myself, right? Because I was like, just going around <laughs> people and roosting people and like, not having too many hard feelings about being competitive. So right, it was right. a it was a good time. And I recommend, you know, for a lot of people out there that are thinking about maybe wanting to try something like that, 
a timekeeping enduro is very it's not like a traditional race and this goes back to the episode that we shot last season with brandon wise about like different types of off-road racing and like right. which one's a great spectacle uh timekeeping enduro you're really just racing against yourself and the clock and every now and then you'll get passed or every now and then you'll pass somebody but for the most part it's just a lovely day out riding in the woods <laughs> a lovely day of being enveloped with this feeling of i must beat everyone around me <laughs> um yeah okay well uh we we that's you might say it's a whole other podcast talking about the red mist and uh, competitive spirit and uh somebody write that down chase write that down our producer chase is making note but we need to move on to our official not the news topic for the day and zach give us a, a 30 second or a, actually like a like a five second what is not the news and, and why are people <laughs> that are tuning in for the first time what are they going to get here not the news is um, sort of hopefully thought-provoking stories from the world of motorcycling that will uh, that are not particularly topical. We're not trying to we're not trying to tell you something you don't know. We are just trying to remind you of something that's going on in the motorcycling world that you may or may not have heard of, and uh, hopefully inspire you to um, think more about it or um, do your own research. I suppose go to common tread at rosilla.com and uh, read more about whatever the heck it is we're talking about. So today, we're talking about Norton yet again, which we should say we we did mention uh, Stuart Garner, the former Norton CEO who got sentenced. I think we talked we talked about that. We have a note here. Talked about that in season five, episode nine. So uh, at the tail end of last season, we talked about that. There's a whole mess with Norton, the famous English brand, uh, financially, just a dumpster fire. Um, <laughs> but now there's. Uh, they're trying to be like some. They're they're, they're trying to revamp a, a, a historic British brand, right? Right, and they have an injection of money from India. Is that correct, Spurge? Yep. TVS is a is TVS, a, right. an Indian company that is not not to be confused with like the Polaris Indian motorcycle company. This is a firm out of India, um, the that country is, India. Yes, that is investing right. 125 million into <laughs> the 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 Norton brand, which right. they apparently acquired in early 2020. Mm -hmm. So the upshot here, the, the, the news story is that uh, there's new injection of cash to Norton and some uh, people, enthusiasts, are trying to revive that brand. The not the news story, which is what we want to talk about, is, is a kind of, I mean, this is a question I want to put to you, Spurge. Is this a good thing? Are you, are you happy that there's another kind of, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a, another set of... Um, defibrillator paddles being put on the Norton brand or 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 not what do you what do you think so it's it's interesting right now right and we're seeing this kind of uh across the board with you know some of these these historic brand names getting revived and and you know there's been a couple of articles on common tread recently um with other brands that this is happening to nor norton's been going on for a while now like i, I think it's probably been 15 years 10 15 years somewhere around mm -hmm. there um since they've been trying to bring back and we originally saw those prototype commandos come out um because i was living in tennessee at the time so it was at least at least 10 years ago um yeah. we should try to try to get a picture on screen and youtube beautiful bike that prototype yeah. commando beautiful I, I think the bigger concern here is like who are who are they going to market this after and, and can they get their cost under control because uh, these bikes historically over the past few years when they do show up show up for north of let's say north of fifteen thousand dollars you know and I, oh, yeah. and I think they're they're even easily you know, right? higher over 20 in some cases yeah. um so it'll be interesting to see if they can get cost under control you know the only way that they're really going to be able to sell these is if they can bring costs down presumably they're going to be aiming at the american market for such a high dollar item either europe mm. or america uh yeah. this isn't something that they're selling you know, in developing markets to try and get, you know, new riders into the play here. So yeah, yeah. What, what are they really going to do with it? You know, and, and honestly, yeah, we're, seeing, we're seeing a shrinking motorcycle segment to begin with. Like we talked about this with Lance Oliver in a previous episode, but like motorcycle sales aren't booming to the point where we need more players in the, in the field. So how many are they planning on <laughs> selling? And is that going to be enough to sustain, you know, what they're trying to do with this? Right, and we should say that you know Norton has had the, the Norton competed in the Isle of Man TT with uh, John McGinnis, famous rider, and they have a V4 uh, engine. There's stuff going on there. I guess my my question is to to hold your feet a little bit closer to the fire, Spurge. Is this, in your opinion, a positive thing for the world of motorcycles to have Norton? 
potentially rejuvenated to have Norton's on the road again? Or would it, or could you argue that it's better to just like, it's, 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 it's over. If you want, if you want a handsome commando replica, get yourself a triumph speed twin 1200. So, and, and just forget about Norton. Let's look at the old bikes. Let's enjoy them for what they, for what they were. And obviously this isn't a decision we can make, but, but could you argue that? So if you are asked, like, is is Norton as a brand right now a, po- a net positive for the motorcycle community? Absolutely not, because they've been plagued with issues. Mm. Um, mm. People have put deposits on them and not gotten their bikes. Timing is all over the place. There was a scan. There was obviously the scandal we talked about with the CEO. You know where they were they were stealing from the pension funds. Like this hasn't been a good look for motorcycling. So as it stands right mm. now, absolutely not. And. You know, unless there is really going to be some reorg going on and, and some some quality and some affordable pricing, I just don't see this as being something other than a niche little, you know, blip. And and frankly, and this is what I'm going to turn around and because you you kind of hit on it at the end. My main point here, it's a great looking bike, but if I gave you twenty thousand dollars and said that you had to choose between a Norton or a Triumph, what are you going to buy? <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna get a triumph for sure. Yeah, and that's, just, just I, so I'm he, clear, for you, he, he kind of shook his head when he was saying it, so his face was a little bit away from the microphone. Zachary said, "I would buy a triumph for sure because it's an I mean, established brand." Perhaps I would. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's the thing. You know, you get you get you get a warranty, you get a dealer network, you get all the things. And there'll be people that don't want that, right? The people that want a, a some sort of spicy Norton because it's one of a hundred and it's bespoke and 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 isn't that cool? And that's fair. You know, that that's not that that doesn't have any value. But yeah, I I think it's an interesting. Uh, I think I think your opinion there is one that might be shared by other people, which is that the brand itself is not necessarily a net positive in the industry right now, and. I think that we should also point out that, you know, there was a time, say, 2000 to what, 2008, 2010, when Indian, the brand, uh, Indian motorcycles, was not a positive influence in the motorcycling industry. And Polaris bought that brand and and rejuvenated it. And it's something now. I think that I think the Indian brand is a positive force in the motorcycling industry that would that would be my uh argument uh, overall you know like they, they have they have good products and and the, the bikes are handsome and uh and they work well and so on and so forth so there is there are success stories and well, there's I, a time when triumph was was no good i think that's an even more so, that's an even more like for like right like for those of you out there that are that are not familiar with the fact yeah, that it's, it's triumph just not was, as triumph, triumph was a brand that went away in i believe 1981 right. john bloor bought the rights to the name and ground up, rebuilt that brand with new engines and new designs, and that was in the the '90s, like the late nine, mid to late right. '90s. And and it took it was timing, you know. They, they, he took his time and he did it right. And now, you know, you fast forward, you know, 25 years, the Triumph brand will go up against any other manufacturer out there. And we talked about yeah. this a little bit with Lance Oliver on the you know the big four Japanese brands, especially when we're talking about like Suzuki kind of fall from grace in America. You look at what Triumph has done in America, and it's it's reputable. Uh, I've got, like I said, I've got many many miles on modern Triumph products, and I've been yeah. you know very pleased with what I've owned. Right. Well, there you have it, folks. Not the news. So ask yourself, you know, what uh, what do you what do you think of this whole Norton situation? And if you don't know um, the the backstory of uh, of the the modern Norton saga, you can certainly Googleize it and uh, and learn for yourself and form your own opinion on uh, what you think should happen with that brand but i guess uh we'll see where all this money takes it and uh w- with any luck it'll it'll be a, another success story yeah I drop, drop us a note <laughs> and let us know if you would be willing to buy a norton I- i'm interested to right. see how many people out there would be willing to put their money where their mouth is to you know invest in, in something like this oh, you mean, especially you mean buy a norton motorcycle i thought you meant does anyone out there have 125 million no, dollars no, no, that no, they're no, willing no. to no. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not going to sit here and speculate on if you had 125 million dollars, would you invest in this brand? No, but like uh, if if they if you went down to your local dealership and there was a, a Norton for sale for 20 grand, you know, would you invest in that? Would you buy that? You know, and I'd be interested to hear if people tier. if people think that that's something that they would be intrigued in. Right, right. Okay, so let's uh, let's move right along, shall we? And uh, and talk about bad motorcycle purchases, and we should kick off this section. By saying we did get an email um, over the summer um, from Arthur P. Arthur P. said, any chance of getting Andy Greaser on as a guest? Maybe you could do a podcast 
about bringing basket cases to life again. So we did get we got an email uh, requesting our very own Andy Greaser from Common Tread to be a guest on High Side Low Side. And Arthur P, we're making your dream come true today. Yeah, Andy's a staff writer for Common Tread. He's been with the well. I don't want to go too far down the road here, but long <laughs> story short, uh, Andy writes a lot of stories about the wild and wacky motorcycles that he purchases and Indeed. how he gets them back to life. So this is a perfect topic to have Andy on to discuss. And without any further ado, let's bring him onto the podcast. All right, everybody, there he is, Andy Greaser. Say hello, Andy, to the ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us, man. Hello, everyone. Thank you for thank you for having me, Spurge, Zach. It is good to see you today. It's your big high side, low side debut, my friend. The, yeah. the public is asking for it, too. We, had, a, we had an email come in from Arthur P. who said, why don't you have Andy Greaser on the podcast? <laughs> and look at this. Here you are. Arthur P., thank you for supporting me, <laughs> believing in me, making this dream come true. So um, <laughs> before we start talking, as is tradition here at High Side, Low Side, before we get into the actual topic, we're going to do a quick uh, lightning round of questions for you, Andy, uh, so that the ladies and gentlemen can get to know you. Um, and I'm going to kick it off, if that's okay, Spurge. I um, would be with the, humbled by letting you kick it off, Zach. <laughs> usually, uh, we start with uh, the basic and fairly broad question of, how did you get into motorcycling, Andy Greaser, and what was your first motorcycle? Okay. Uh, I got into motorcycling about as soon as I could reach the handlebars on my dad's mini bike. So lifelong rider here. And I guess we could count that mini bike as my first motorcycle in a way, since there was a possibility of putting plates on it, but you really shouldn't have been running it on the street. Uh, it was a 1970 something Benelli, uh, dynamo 65 CC. And Ooh. that was a little temper temperamental two stroke that I, <laughs> rode a lot, fixed a lot. And uh, I guess my first proper street bike uh, was Kawasaki KZ400, but I, I like the Benelli better. And that's saying, that's saying a lot against the KZ, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> what, what year was the KZ400? Uh, that was a 78. I didn't have the big bore KZ440 like you have, Spurgeon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, real powerhouse of a motorcycle. <laughs> uh, yes. All right. So next question. Spurge, you want to take this one or yeah, are, yeah. You, so, are you too embarrassed? No, no, no. So Andy, just to kind of <laughs> fill in fill in for our audience who you are and, and, and what you do within the RevZilla organization, uh, how long have you worked at RevZilla? What's your job title? What do you, what do you normally do on a day-to-day? -day? Sure. So I am the associate editor of Common Tread and I've been working at RevZilla for almost five years. My, my Zillaversary is this September. Wow. And, um, yeah, I think I'll take Spurgeon out somewhere. We'll, <laughs> uh, we'll just talk about all the all the fond memories and stories of uh, projects we worked on because <laughs> I do what I do is write stories for Common Tread. That's my primary job. So uh, sometimes I go to review motorcycles. Sometimes I'm covering the news, doing opinion pieces, maybe some research based stuff, and I also write the little landing page articles where high side, low side uh, videos and podcasts can live. So right. uh, long, long time listener, first time uh, guest. <laughs> host, I guess. So you, you will write the article for this, for this very podcast in that you are participating in. I never, I didn't really think about that until right now. Yeah, oh, but the, been, the beauty of this is that we're not going to have to give him the synopsis ahead of time because he's already know what it's about. <laughs> he knows exactly what's going to happen. So no, I've been thinking about this for a while, how <laughs> I'm going to navigate this because right. you know, I do have a little interest in talking myself up, but you don't want to come across too strong. So right. yeah, we'll that's, a, that's a real problem for you. Yeah, you're really shy away <laughs> from uh, the ego. <laughs> so uh, on the topic of the all of the many tasks, uh, articles that you write, uh, types of articles that you write for Common Tread. How many articles have you written for Common Tread? Do you know, or would you ask? Can you estimate? Oh, it's well over five hundred at this point. Um, I, I know Lance still has a running head start on me since he was working on Common Tread stories long before I joined up. But um, I, I have to pull the number on that. It's it's quite a few. Spurgeon should know. He's uh, he's my manager, I guess. So <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. I keep well, a, I keep a can, daily tally on uh, how many meeting. articles. Yeah, no, I know it's it's over five hundred. <laughs> you're you're right behind Lance. You are now what the second second highest producer of articles in Common Trade history. Yeah, wow. it, felt, it felt pretty good when I passed Lemmy, but man, that lightning Lance Oliver is oh. hard to catch. <laughs> he is. He is indeed. Well, that's a that's that's Hall of Fame stuff there, man. 
uh, the, the the all the all those articles. The Revzilla Historical Hall of Fame. But so shift, shifting away from from what you do for Revzilla, you know, in your personal life, you are someone that, as you've kind of alluded to, you've been a lifetime motorcyclist. But you're also a, a pretty accomplished mechanic, and you're somebody that likes to tackle uh, mechanical tasks that other people might shy away from, myself included. Uh, so what is the most difficult slash fulfilling mechanical task that you have tackled to date? Ooh, difficult for me is always engine rebuilds, right? Uh, I think making sure that not only all of the pieces that you've taken out and put back or where they're supposed to be and adjusted correctly, <laughs> uh, all, all of that is so important, but it's also important to satisfy yourself. And that's so much of the work. I know that it would be possible to throw an engine together with my guessing and checking uh, along the way to, to get it done. But when I'm doing it for myself or for somebody else, uh, I don't want to do it twice. And so that adds this extra layer of work that uh, probably doesn't need to be there, but I don't want to find out if, what happens if I don't do it. So uh, <laughs> I, I'm going to say, yeah, definitely taking an engine down to the crank and, so, and putting it back together. So is, what's the, what's the most fulfilling one? Yeah. Yeah. So like a quick follow up, like, do, can you, can you think of one project where you got done and you're like, wow, I did it. Good for me. Um, as far as, are, are you talking about the fulfilling or the challenging? Fill it fulfilling. Thought, Let's yeah, not, fulfilling, not, yeah. not, not challenge. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like engine rebuilding is challenging for you. What's the one <laughs> thing that you've done that's really left you with a sense of pride? I'm going to say the thing that leaves me feeling with, with a sense of pride, uh, a, actually a great example from the last couple of years, uh, was not a terrible engine rebuild or, or anything like that at all. It was throwing together a junk bike for the reliability rally and completing that. It's it's the experience after you figure out that all of the stuff that you did ended up working. Uh, that bike, the, the bike I'm talking about specifically in this case was a really junky Kawasaki Ninja 500. And I didn't really do any of my best work on that bike, but I did everything that I had to do to see <laughs> it through this 450 mile challenge. Um, and it felt great to have taken a bike that was garbage and put it back to, into running order with basically the bare minimum. I, I really gave myself uh, a lot of flexibility with what I considered good enough on that motorcycle. Um, yeah. But it's that first ride, um, first time you're really putting the bike to the test, that's when it's all, when all the work is worth it. That's when your, uh, wrench to ride ratio starts to go in the positive direction <laughs> and the experience <laughs> becomes a whole new dimension of fun, I guess. It's so, good to know. It's good to know that you are, that you feel that way because some, some people like working on bikes. they just sort of seem like they're masochists. They just like want to work on bikes because they like working on bikes, but ultimately you like riding, which is why you, you tinker so that you can enjoy the other aspect of it, which is encouraging. And I, I think, think that, I think the reliability rally is something that a lot of people out there would, would enjoy. So Andy Greaser oh, yeah. has written a lot of articles, uh, a good handful of articles about the reliability rally. So you can head over to common tread and you can look up, uh, Andy's articles about, uh, prepping for participating in and, the, the aftermath of the reliability rallies. Andy, in 30, in 30 seconds or less, if, if someone's listening, you know, give us the 30-second synopsis of what is the reliability rally. Sure. So if you were a fan of the old Top Gear specials where they go out and buy a bunch of junky vehicles and try <laughs> to do this ambitious road trip with them, it's that but for motorcycles. So you buy a motorcycle that is up to $1,000, after that initial purchase price, you can do whatever you want to it, but most people just try to get them running and take it out to an event. It's uh, generally two days, something around 400 to 500 miles. And along the way, there are different challenges like fuel economy. Uh, there's a slow race. There's an eighth mile um, acceleration time. And then there are some <laughs> other challenges that are less objective, like uh, best modification, or there's a crowd favorite. And all of these points come together at the end to determine uh, who has the best junk motorcycle. Of course, purchase price factors into this too. So getting it for as little money as possible will get you ahead big time. 
Well, mm. that was that was 39 seconds, but you did a heck of a job. <laughs> I now right. understand what it is. Zach, what's the last question for Andy before we move on to the topic? So the last question in our lightning round is actually the first question of the the main part of the podcast here, because we're talking about bad uh, motorcycle purchases, which is uh, fairly mo- broad. Mo- most and- of the purchases that Andy has made over his career, I don't think he realizes. It, <laughs> okay, but, well, like, we're he's gonna- made a lot of bad ones. Right, right. We're going to argue about that. During I'm holding this, back. Uh, I'm yeah. holding back. <laughs> So the 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 last question here, uh, last slash first question, is Andy Greaser. What are the last five bikes that you've purchased? Just to give people an idea of uh, of what's in your garage and and what type of person you are. <laughs> Zach, are you sure you want to know? I am. Why? Well, I, I think I might know. I think I know at least a few of them. I think Arthur yeah. P wants to know. That's more oh yeah, Arthur P definitely. Right. Arthur wrote in you just to what? hear you, Andy. I'll do it for Arthur P. Okay. Thank you for believing in me, guy. Uh, so the <laughs> last five motorcycles that I have purchased, uh, do, do you just want make and model and year or do you That's want- That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. We'll yeah keep yeah. it to that. A 1977 BMW R100 slash seven. Before that, I bought two Vespas in a package deal, a 1972 Vespa 50 special and a 1964 Vespa V90. Okay. Before that, I bought a 1999 Kawasaki ZRX 1100. <laughs> and my fifth bike is that Ninja from the Reliability Rally, a 1994 Kawasaki EX 500. Do you gotcha. still have all so, five of those in the garage right now? I have four of them. The Ninja 500 was sold. It's sold for a pretty big profit, knowing you, Andy Greaser. I think it was a fair price. But, <laughs> uh, okay, last, so last I heard, that bike had been uh, messed up a little bit in a traffic incident. So oh, I don't, that's... I don't know if it's with us any longer. But the you owner was okay. I hate to hear it. So um, those those five most recent purchases were bookended by reliability rally motorcycles because you rode the you took the the EX five hundred Kawasaki to a reliability rally. It was your first reliability rally, if memory serves. And then and then you the the R one hundred BMW, the old Airhead BMW twin, you bought to go to another reliability rally. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yes, that's exactly it. And the danger of the reliability rally is <laughs> not the motorcycles that we are riding. They are. They are dangerous. Uh, they're pretty well the worst motorcycles that you will see on the road. <laughs> but even more dangerous than that is the fact that this fun event gives you an excuse to purchase additional junk motorcycles that you really didn't need in your life. And uh, you, you right. can see what this is doing to my garage. But uh, <laughs> I, I'm not going to say that I have any regrets about so it. So right. define. So just, and I think this is going to help to outline the episode for for uh, a lot of people, right? Because one of the things we want to we want to get into is like worst motorcycles that we've ever purchased. You know, like what, like some really fundamentally bad ones. But before to, to kind of outline this, like in your mind, because you just talked about some of the bikes of the reliability rally being dangerous. What we explain that? Like, what's what's dangerous about these motorcycles? What's not good about these motorcycles? What are some of the condition uh, that that <laughs> you know these bikes are in that that make them not great? Uh, well, I guess I should start by saying there is some expectation that the motorcycle you are riding at this event or really any other event is not a complete death trap, right? The brakes should work. The tires should hold air. Things like that. The bare the, the bare minimum of what the, you should expect minimum, for a motorcycle. The bare minimum. Yeah. <laughs> but with any older machine, there is always a possibility that something bad could happen, right? If a chain wasn't changed out and it's been sitting in a pool of its own rust for 20 years in somebody's yard, then yeah, maybe that would come apart. And that's probably something you should change before the event. Uh, maybe something more realistic would be like the engine dropping a valve and locking up, right? That that could be a potentially dangerous situation. Those sort of things don't really uh, happen too much at the events. It's amazing the, the punishment that these older bikes can take. <laughs> um, but I also come from a background of uh, restoring older motorcycles. And so it's not quite as scary or weird to me that bikes can do that because I've been around that world for such a long time. Well, with a last name like Greaser, how could you not? It was right. It was either work at Revzilla or, you know, work at the garage down the street. So. Valvoline. They're hiring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, well, that's. I think that's. I think it's a fair question. So I think let's let's um let's uh pivot real quick, Spurge. What what are the last five bikes that you purchased, Spurge and Dunbar? Me. Yeah. Uh. All right. Well, we and we you can do them pretty because yep, we yep, talked I'm, about yep, this. I'm in gonna the last. count. I'll count yep. Nicole's. So a KLX 230L, <laughs> a uh eight nine a KTM 890 Adventure R Rally, a KTM uh 350 <laughs> EXCF, I guess before that would have been Tiger 900. The, or no, sorry, Tiger 800. No, the KTM 1090. Oh, the 1090. Okay, yep. And then before that would have been, yeah, before that would have been the 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 Tiger, the Tiger 800. Okay, all right. Not all um, those bikes are with us anymore either. You know, <laughs> right, so. right. But that's a, and that's that's kind of a linear. So to go in backwards order, you got Tiger 800, KTM 1090. KTM, KTM 350 EXC, 350, then the and then 890, 890 rally, and then a dirt bike then for a, your fiance. Yeah, yeah. So so that, that that's a pretty that's a curve. I feel like you can follow. Yeah, and I would Guys, say that as far as like were they good purchases? Like <laughs> these were not these were not Andy Greaser level motorcycles. All right, people. all right. Let's not throw the yeah. let's not throw the man under the the bus yet. So to, just to just because I know everyone's dying to know, I counted my last five motorcycle purchases, and I. I actually don't know if I've ever purchased five motorcycles total <laughs> in my life. I think, I think it's possible that, unless I'm forgetting something, I bought a KTM 450 EXC that I turned into a supermoto when I was in college. Nice. And then, uh, and then I bought that Aprilia scooter that I just sold. <laughs> And then in 2006 or something, and then I bought my KTM 950, which I still have. And then I bought a CRF 50 Supermoto mini bike. <laughs> and I think that's Andy every Greaser's motorcycle I've mo- ever owned. Andy's, Andy's bought more motorcycles in the past three years than you've bought in your entire lifetime. Probably in the I past was wondering year. when we were asking this question, if many guests would be able to answer it. I'm, I'm glad that I was able to do that for you. But uh, <laughs> five, five motorcycles can be a lot, especially if somebody gets in the door or finds a, a second motorcycle that really speaks to them, there is nothing wrong with just sitting on a bike that you like for a while. And especially being in the industry where we have the ability to test ride other motorcycles, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I think understand that, not loading up on bikes. Not, yeah, I think that, that, not that I certainly, practice that, but I understand it. <laughs> I think that certainly affected my my uh, you know my career as a as a motorcycle purchaser is being able to ride other stuff. But just but even, it, but, it, but even if it hasn't, I would say that like I think the three of us probably make up the complete arch of people out there, right? There's people like Zach that have really you know they buy one bike and they kind of stick with it forever. Yep, yep. There are people like myself that you know every couple of years they freshen up what's in the stable, and then there's <laughs> people like Andy who's you know constantly out there wheeling and dealing, and he's probably buying more stuff that can be fixed up and then turned around, whereas most of the stuff that I'm buying is just out there ready to ride. So I think mm. we're we're kind of like a nice little arc there. Yeah, yeah. Some diversity in our motorcycle purchasing, anyway. Um, so, quick sidebar before we before we move on, Andy. How many bikes do you think you have owned? How I, I have I have owned, yeah. Like how many how many bikes have you purchased and then sold or like over over the years? Do- yeah, dozens, I, right? At this point, in in and out of the garage, yeah, definitely two dozen, uh, pro- possibly possibly more than that. And some and of you, them only come for a short time. Before <laughs> they, they only visit for are, a short time. Are sent well, along. He's not an old man, Andy Greaser, either. Uh, everybody, you know, we we he's written more than five hundred articles for for Common Tread. He's he's worked at Revzilla for five years now but you're 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 a spring chicken compared to to spurge and myself are you not are you willing to share your age with the with the audience uh, sure i'm i'm 29 and i am it's, younger than most go. of the motorcycles i work on and if you if you know if you're if you're <laughs> listening if you're listening to this you could you, you know you'd be falsely impressioned by his smoky sultry voice you'd think he was you know in his 40s the way that he you know has exactly. that deep you know lulling uh timber uh to his tone <laughs> But all no, the he's, carb, a, he's a young all man. The carb cleaner has aged me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's not. It's not in Marbreds anymore. It's just carb cleaner and uh, fumes in the garage. So, of all those dozens of motorcycles over the years, Andy Greaser, what would you say is the worst motorcycle purchase that you've ever made, in your opinion? Oof. <laughs> I, <laughs> I and feel free to name bikes as you go along here, because I'm sure we and the listening audience will be will be um, entertained to hear the, some of the contenders. Yeah, that is 
what we're talking about here in this episode. And <laughs> I want to start this off saying I don't regret the majority of the motorcycles that I've purchased. <laughs> I understand that other people would look at them and say, this bike uh, does not look to be in very good condition. This bike does not have an engine. Uh, this bike... <laughs> I think, really... it's, I think it's important to note for our audience when we approached Andy about doing this episode <laughs> offline and we said we want to do an episode about like the worst motorcycles you've ever you've ever purchased and he was like I- I've never purchased a bad motorcycle and we're like Andy we, we, we've heard the stories <laughs> like you've got a like there's there's a dozen of them that are bad and he's like no man he's like I, I don't know what I even talk about because like they're all great motorcycles so Andy's really reaching yeah. down deep to come up with an answer for this question I, I'd also like to say that when you started talking Andy and you said I you know I'd like to preface this with something I thought it was going to be like i'd like to apologize to my mother for all what i'm about and instead you were like i regret nothing i've done everything this this is exactly the life i want to lead no, anyway I'd, i continue wouldn't, i wouldn't take too many of them back but <laughs> that's because i know that they're bad when i go into this right. purchasing decision okay. i know what i'm getting into it's okay that it looks the way that it is uh it's okay that it's missing what is missing because <laughs> I can see that I understand it and I'm not, I'm still right. going through with this decision, but that's fair. That leads to the actual worst motorcycles that I've ever had. They're the free bikes. Mm. Ah, so interesting. People like Arthur P know that I like older motorcycles. And when <laughs> there's an abandoned motorcycle in a garage or a barn or somebody's just trying to get rid of something, they reach out to me, maybe once or twice a month this happens, and say, I've got one of these for you. Do you want this motorcycle? I've got your next project. Right. And of course, this is interesting to me, but (laughs) I have learned the hard way that the free motorcycles are the worst ones because... Mm -hmm. It's not something that you wanted in the first place. (laughs) And whatever it was reached its state of abandonment, neglect, disrepair, whatever, for some reason. Usually because (laughs) it wasn't that great of a motorcycle to begin with. (laughs) Nobody else wanted to do anything with it. So uh, I do operate under uh, a, a sort of motto or slogan in my shop. It's, this is greasers, no kill motorcycle shelter. If it comes in the door, I will make a sincere effort to do something about it. And <laughs> so I've started, I've started saying no a lot more. And I'm glad that I'm doing that because, okay. um, even though I do want to get these things back on the road, even if it's not for, for myself, right. I also need to make sure to keep my focus on projects that I actually want to be working on because nothing sucks the fun out of a bike like that, that having to buy an expensive part for it that you weren't anticipating um, with no little to no reward at the end. It's not carrying the passion that a bike like the ZRX or the Vespas or the R100 slash seven carry for me. I, like those motorcycles a lot. I want to own them and ride them and work on them. So the philosophy and psychology behind these rebuilds shifts, um, and it has rarely shifted for the better in a free bike situation. So I'll give you one yeah, concrete yeah. So, so the, I would say the, the, I would say the free bike thing is a good overarching you know, yeah, right. point, but like what's, but we the, need what's names. the, yeah, point the, fingers. What's the yeah. last one? Oh, I got, I got one. The last one that came in free and left without any tears being shed was a 1981 Suzuki GN400. Okay. And you've never heard of that bike maybe because it wasn't a really good bike. Uh, <laughs> so this is in the early 80s. Suzuki sees the other big Japanese manufacturers building little cruisers. And they say, we've got to get a little cruiser and get in the game. So <laughs> instead of developing one, they took their dirt bike a kickstart only air-cooled single and threw some cruiser looking parts on it and they uh, got some chrome bits and they put these cool pentagram wheels on it and said here you go it's a mini cruiser (laughs) you're welcome everybody yeah except it was really just a compromised kick only 400 dirt bike 
Um, it kind of reminded me of my old SR500. It was light and thin, which was neat, but the parts availability was not great for it. And <laughs> I just didn't enjoy riding the bike that much. The redeeming side to that story though, is that the bike was sold to a beginner rider for a pretty small amount of money, I think for a, for a, for a running and riding ready to go motorcycle. Sure, sure. And that ended up being a, a good way to start riding. It's light, it's easy to work on if you want to be your own mechanic and also uh, learn your way around beginner riding. That's not a terrible choice. And right. if you drop it, and you learn how, and you learn how to kickstart your motorcycle. <laughs> sure. Yeah. The, Which everyone should know how who, to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. Uh, that's, got to be worth some cool points at the gas station too. Sure, right? sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, I think I, I like where you're going here. The 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 like Spurgeon said, the free thing is almost a loophole because technically the question was what's the worst motorcycle purchase you've made? So, something that you spent your your hard-earned money on and then uh, and then down the road you, you know, at, at some point you thought, "Oh boy, the, this was like I shouldn't have done this for this reason, or it's so much worse than I thought it was going to be, or whatever it was. So I'm going to let, let so sure. I'm going to let Andy think about that one. So Andy, oh, take, take, got, take a second and think. Oh, you have it already. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go Yamaha, for it. <laughs> a Yamaha RT 180 with a very damaged crankshaft, uh, which I discovered after and tearing. Is that down. a is that a little like two stroke dual sport? Yeah. If you remember the DT 175 and yeah, yeah, sure. It was. Uh, an extension of that line that, that came a little later. Gotcha. How much did you? How much did you pay for it? Three hundred bucks. And did you <laughs> make money on that? Did you lose money on that, or did you just sell it at a loss? How did you get to rid be, of it? To be determined. I put it in boxes and stuffed it up in the attic. I can't look at it anymore. <laughs> so right. it's it's we're, it's we're in on pieces a break. now. Yeah, it's we're a, on a break. Gotcha. Oh man. That's tough. What, the fun, well, the fun just disappeared from it as things started getting more and more expensive for a bike that I really didn't care about all that much. So you, so greasers no kill motorcycle shelter, but sometimes they get taken apart and put in boxes and put in the attic, and they're so they're in sort of cryo freeze. They're not dead, but but they're but they're in the penalty box. Oh, big time penalty box. May, so. may God, may God help you if you ever start an animal shelter because you can't just put them in the attic and not feed <laughs> yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Um, so well, there's <laughs> there's no room. It's full of motorcycles. <laughs> so let's 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 turn this question to you, Zach, because I know that you have obviously a much smaller stable uh, throughout history. Mm, but indeed. what's what's probably the it's, worst motorcycle you've ever purchased? It's not about why. the size of the stable. It's yeah, but what's whatever. okay? It's about anyway. the, it's about it's about the worst I'm motorcycle just, in your stable. I'm what's the kidding, worst yeah. motorcycle you ever bought? So. The worst motorcycle. Let's see. What did I write down here? I took some notes, everybody. I'm a professional, sort of. <clears throat> I think I so I bought I bought when I was in college at some point, I bought that KTM four fifty uh EXC, which is a which was at that point it was used, but like a modern late model KTM four fifty dirt bike with a headlight and a taillight. Um, that I could in Vermont at the time anyway, make street legal. And I thought I'm going to have this big honking dirt bike, which I live in Vermont. So that's all good. And then I go to college in Boston. So I'm going to put, excuse me, I'm going to put 17 inch, uh, wheels and tires on it. And I'm going to make a little supermoto out of it and I can take it to Boston and it'll be a 450 supermoto, which will be pretty rad, which in, in some ways it was, but as we know, and perhaps we'll talk about in more detail, sometimes modifications that you make to a motorcycle do not increase their value. That's, um, <laughs> in fact, often that's the case. I think we can agree. Um, so I think that by putting street wheels and tires on it, I probably, at the very least, I narrowed the the amount of people who would be interested in buying it <laughs> from me. Um, and I don't remember how much I paid for it and how much I sold it for, but I feel like I took that, a that, pretty that big L on that. A, that was a, it, that was the, the street legal dirt bike, right? That was like the predecessor to the bike that I have now. Right. A little bit more streety. Does your EXC have a headlight and a taillight? Oh yeah. 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 Oh, it does. Okay. And the XCF. Yeah. It's like a dirt bike, but with like a gotcha. headlight and a taillight and turn signals. Right. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, so it it was basically a fairly hardcore off-road bike that you could, you know, in in some states anyway, ride on the street. Yeah. <laughs> um and uh yeah, so I think I, I think I took a pretty big L on the on the 
when I sold it, I think I sold it to a guy who was like, I'm into that. And <clears throat> you know, he bought it for what was maybe a fair price, but it was one of those things where it was like, I didn't have a line of people waiting to buy it. You know, yeah. it was sort of like, I can sell it to this guy or I can keep it and hope that it's worth more later, which is just not going to happen. Um, so I, I, I don't know if it's a, like a, a bad purchase, but I think realistically it was a purchase that was tinged with a little bit more enthusiasm than knowledge, shall we, shall we say. Um, and I don't think I, you know, I, I, yeah, it was a good experience. I had fun with it. It was a fun bike, but I think realistically I could have done more with that money and something, and it got something that would have lasted a little longer in my stable and, and served me a little bit, a little bit better. So I think if that's your worst, I am envious. All right. (laughs) Well, I think it's interesting because like you, you, you talked about knowledge and I think Andy talked about, um, the, the main point that Andy kind of drove home was like buy something that you're actually interested in. And, and right. I think those are two real just key takeaways in general for people. Cause we get the question a lot about like, Oh, I want to buy a project bike. Right. Like this was something we talked Ugh. about, I think in the last episode, that's on my list. Yeah. And it's like, if you buy a project bike, make sure like Andy said, it's something you're interested in right? and make sure it's something that you're relatively knowledgeable about. Uh, because right. if you get in over your head, the easiest thing to stop doing is working on the project bike that's overwhelming yeah. you. Yeah, and I, I think I'll say that I I benefited from some of that enthusiasm that I had. You know, I mean, I I I the 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 transformation from dirt bike to supermoto is not as simple as some people would have you believe. So I learned a lot about how um, how street tires fit into in a dirt swing arm and how caliper relocator kits work for front brakes and um, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, so I don't, I don't regret it outright, but I think, yeah, and to Andy's point, you know, I don't have a lot of, uh, I don't have a lot to draw from here, but, um, you could also argue just to, to, to take, take a different path that the Aprilia scooter that I just sold for 1600 bucks was, uh, I paid $3,000 for that 15 years ago. And I've, you know, put 1200 miles on it in that amount of time. So I haven't gotten great, uh, you know, I didn't get a great return on that either. I probably should have sold it 10 years ago, but instead I like toted it around to the different cities I lived in and yeah, but as wished far it ran as the better and blah, blah, blah. that you got hit on with that, it wasn't like you, it wasn't like you didn't get anything for it. And it was something and that, was that you and your wife with, enjoyed so. riding around, you know, uh, the, the beach <laughs> on the weekend or something like that. Like you had some memories sure. with it. Yeah. Sure, what sure. I'm hearing That's is certain. that, uh, Aprilia scooter is better than a KTM Supermoto. Ooh, fighting <laughs> words. I think, that, I think that's what words. I. I think no, I think that's what I just heard. Yeah. Well, it's we we all we have that fear, don't we? Everyone who anyone who's owned any vehicle or any thing really, but I feel like especially motorcycles, when you sell them, if you've held on to them long enough, by the time you sell them, you have this tickle in the back of your head that you're like, oh, is it going to be worth more soon? Is it going to like, is there, for some reason it's going to, and maybe not stuff, maybe not an RT 180 Yamaha, you know, that you put in boxes, Andy. I, I think, I think there are certainly some uh, bikes that fall outside that realm, but the point is it's a, uh, a certain type of personality that I think is not uncommon in the motorcycling world is one that's like a little bit pack ratty, a little bit, right. A little bit kind of like, Oh, I could just keep it. Maybe, maybe it'll be like, maybe people will want it more next year. Maybe it'll be better. Maybe something good will happen for some reason, which is uh, not necessarily the healthiest thing to think. Well, um, I would say that right now we're living in a time where if you are a pack rat that are, you're waiting for to get maximum dollar out of your used <laughs> motorcycle. This is the year. The people. iron is like, hot. Yeah. Like, and right. I think that kind of touches on some of what we're talking about here in, in that like, I, and and this is kind of get into the one you know, the worst purchases that I've made. Is yeah, that, that was kinda, my next question, Spurge. What's your what's your what's your answer? Yeah, I've done some house cleaning recently because you know <laughs> I I got stuck with some things in my garage where I was like, you know what, like this is just I'm not coming back to this, right? And I was between two, um, I was between a, a '76 CB550 and the uh, the Kawasaki 440 LTD from I think like I want to say it's 81 it's either 81 or 83 I can't remember but it's like but yours, are, that's a that's a twin right the 440 yeah the 440 oh, yeah. is a, a little L- parallel L- twin cruiser LTD living the dream yeah so so here's so here's where I determined where I fell on this because I was really trying to figure out the worst one I bought the the CB550 for I think it was $600 $600 in a case of beer and I sold it for 
I want to say $900. So I made money on that one after holding on to it for 10 years. And the other thing that was rewarding about that one was when I bought it, uh, the guy couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. He took it to a shop. And what would happen was he would take it to the shop for an electronic issue. And and it's a CB550 from the 70s, right? There's not too many electronics on here. But it would stall out. He would come to a stop sign and the bike would just die. And then it wouldn't start again. It would blow the main fuse and he would you know, have to push it home. What happened was somebody had put a uh, electronic ignition on it. They took the points and condensers off. They put an electronic ignition on, mm-hmm. and they ran the wire up the backbone of the frame underneath the tank. The problem was where the seat came in on the tank, it would pinch the wire. And when it pinched the wire, it would ground the wire, blow the fuse, kill the bike. And whatever shop he took it to couldn't figure this out. So I was able to solve the problem of why the bike didn't work right away. Got it put back together, rode it around a little bit, but then I made the mistake of taking it apart again. And I told myself <laughs> I was going to restore it, and I never did. Uh, and it sat in my garage in pieces, and I eventually sold it during the pandemic um, to just get rid of it and get it out of the garage. I, I, I wasn't going to get back into it. And the worst purchase, however, though, goes to the, the Kawasaki 440 LTD. It was sitting in shambles in the back of a buddy's garage. Uh, I didn't get it for free, but it was $75. Um, and it's almost, it's almost insulting that they would charge you $75. You're just just handing some, yeah, you're just handing somebody a small wad of money so that they don't accuse you of theft. That's all that's (laughs) happening in that transaction. It's just to say formally that this person didn't steal this from (laughs) what I should have, what I should have, and there was no title, but I was able to get a title for it. What I should have done, because this goes back to Andy's point. I had no interest in that bike whatsoever. No interest in a tiny parallel twin cruiser from the 80s that made maybe 20 horsepower couldn't have cared less what i should have done was put a battery in it clean the carburetors clean the gas tank and sold it for 500 bucks made 400 bucks and been like cool i'm I'm out of this thing right but there's a company called dime city cycles down in florida and they made this kit for this specific motorcycle so there's apparently enough people out there that own 440 ltds where they chop the frame off and they put like a little hoop kit on it and they make it look like a little cafe racer. And Spurgeon Dunbar, era 2011, was pretty keen on like the whole little cafe racer craze these, that was popping these up. These cafe racers, sure. these are going to yeah. be the future. So I chopped the rear frame off, had a buddy weld it, weld this kit on there, and that's where it stopped. <laughs> and the problem was I got into other stuff. I got into adventure bikes. I got into dirt bikes. Right. I got into things that I was more passionate about. So to Andy's point, when it was like, I can either drop $400 on a set of progressive shocks that I need for this bike because now the shocks that came on it are way too short and I need longer yeah. shocks and progressive makes it. Right. I could put 400 bucks into this bike that's still not done yet and it's probably not going to be done even with the shocks or... I could put four hundred dollars into a skid plate for a Tiger eight hundred that was brand new in my garage. You know, I think, right? I think Spurgeon might have the worst bikes here in this discussion right. about well, you know what what your worst bikes were because Spurgeon offered both the CB and the KZ to me and I turned them down. <laughs> At least I mm. bought my worst motorcycle. That's so groundbreaking. I so those might be the two worst ones here. What I fairness, thought, what you I thought, never you never gave it serious consideration. I mean, I was making <laughs> you a pretty handsome deal, and you never really you never really thought about it hard enough. What I I saw, I saw the pictures. I saw the carnage. What I thought you were going to say, Andy, was. Spurgeon might not have the worst purchases here, but he's made the worst decisions <laughs> with the bikes that he's had. Not no just comment. with, bi- not just with bike, no Zach. I, I've made some bad decisions in life in general, so I'm, I'm probably winning at, at multiple games. Wow. But yeah, wow. I think I would so, say the, the Kawasaki 440 LTV, LTD takes it for me I think, over the I think, CB. And I know, Andy, you have a, you have a, you, you're looking at your own motorcycle purchases through rose colored glasses, as you have admitted thus far in the podcast. But I think. My opinion of uh, like I don't think my my purchases are, are feeble as we discussed. But between the two of you, I think you I think yours takes the cake. Spurge, I agree. Would you agree, <sighs> Andy, that, that that 440 LT that's that's the worst purchase that any of the three of us have made? His is sitting in boxes in the That's attic. true. That's Mine's true. Mine's at least a decorative running frame that gets used on the high side, <laughs> low side podcast from time to time. A uh, decorative uh, yeah. running frame. Yeah. I've I've ridden a KZ400, uh, and by all accounts, the 440 is not really an improvement. <laughs> I think it's so, worse. I, I think people think of like, oh, it's it's a little bit bigger. I, I think it was actually much more of a turd. 
Do you know how many people are probably looking this up right now too and trying to figure out what these bikes even are that we're talking about? There was no, yeah, there yeah, was yeah. a there was a gentleman who left a comment, I believe it was a gentleman, who left a comment on the episode one of season six, because we talked about this with Patrick Garvin, and he was like, I own an eighty one Kawasaki four forty L T D. Awesome awesome bike. And I was like, Ooh. All right, that's Agree to thing. disagree. And now that's he's going to comment on this podcast and be like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> and be like, hey. Yeah. So here, here's the question to, to move the podcast along just a little bit. What is the worst motorcycle purchase that you can make or that you could have made historically? What what's a what's does a, it have a f- does it have to be a it doesn't have to be a bike right like just like no, we in can a, in a well theme. we can start with categories if we okay. want to, um, but you knew you could say at the very you could say I think an early eighties Japanese cruiser that was in disrepair sitting in someone's basement that I paid seventy five bucks for is near the top of the list like that's a bad. I think we could probably all just take. agree that an 80s Japanese cruiser in general was probably the worst purchase you could <laughs> okay. make. Uh, now you're alienating our audience a little bit here, Spurge, but yeah, you know, I, I, I tend to agree with you. Yeah, we'll uh, maybe roll past that a little bit. There is a <laughs> pretty good article on this uh, this website called Common Tread. You might have heard of it where we're talking about how older metric cruisers uh, or, or just metric cruisers in general are some of the last great deals in motorcycling. So not all of them are necessarily bad. <laughs> Definitely check out that article if you're interested in this kind of stuff. But if right. you don't mind, I'd like to give my idea for uh, what the worst, this is this, this is the, the worst motorcycle purchase that exists. Is that what we're talking about? Uh, yeah, here? yeah. Con- yeah. You know, theoretically anyway, un- unless yeah. you have actual facts to back it up, but theoretically the worst motorcycle purchase that you could, could make or could have made. I think it's not a specific model it's uh, it's any motorcycle that you outright can't afford and let me get into that a, a little bit more here uh, we're talking about worst purchases not worst motorcycles of all time and i think a purchase true that uh, jeopardizes your your finances um, that is only going to get worse over time I think that's about as bad as it can get. And specifically, we're looking, I'm looking at things where you've purchased a bike with bad financing hmm. or uh, or you just have, or your finances aren't in a position where you should be buying that bike. But if you buy a motorcycle that you can't afford, hey, that's great, enjoy your bike. If you're buying below your means, like I do sometimes, uh, <laughs> that's that's not a big deal either because if it doesn't work out, it's not like you have risked a whole lot on it. But I think going into the dealership when you probably shouldn't and by assigning some paperwork for a really long-term loan with a pretty high interest rate on a motorcycle that you don't need to have, um, if you get to a, a place where the balance of your loan on that bike is greater than what it would be worth if you resold it, if you end up upside down on this motorcycle, it Ooh. gets worse from there. And that to me seems like the worst purchase that you could make is, is something that you can't support long term. I, I think I think that's a I think that's a great answer. Wasn't expecting this to be the fidelity podcast. Was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, Andy th- Greaser with really, his financial advice. Exactly. Uh, Andy Financial Greaser with the left hook. You know, that's that's a that's a great point. I think we were all kind of like uh focused on bad motorcycle purchases in so much as the bike being bad and it being a, a bad investment because the machine is bad. But really, if you're stretching yourself outside your means, you you maybe I, I, I maybe this is where you're going with it, Andy. But to to take your point a step further, you could also argue that that would detract from some of the enjoyment that you might have in using the motorcycle because you might be you're afraid uh, one of those riders. Ex- exactly. Yeah, like, you can't exactly. tip it over. You can't like oh don't touch it. No, nobody touch it. Nobody look at. It. Don't breathe around it because it's you know if if I tip it over, then I'm really I'm really pushed yeah. here. And maybe those low payments are pretty great up front. You've got a little hop in your step because you're only paying this much money for this amazing motorcycle every month. <laughs> but after three, four years, is it still fun to send that check? Is it still mm-hmm. the motorcycle that it was when you started? Do you Ooh. still feel the same way about this bike? I can't answer that for you, but <laughs> your bank may be able to answer that for you. I don't know. Interesting. Well, so quick follow up there. What's the most, if you feel comfortable sharing, uh, you know, uh, thrills and spills of your financial past, Andy Greaser, what's the most expensive motorcycle you've ever purchased? A couple grand. 
You know, my, two two grand is the most expensive motorcycle you've ever bought. Yeah. I, wow. for, for those of you that's, listening, that's incredible. Radio, radio my, silence. My, my, yeah, my, my <laughs> face, <laughs> speechless. Is speechless. My face is is flabbergasted. <laughs> if, you, if you can't see it. So you you bought a ninety nine Kawasaki ZRX eleven 1, hundred for less than a couple thousand bucks. You don't know what I went, what I spent on that, but I will tell you <laughs> if you want to hear it. Oh man. Okay. Well, what, okay. How much was it? I bought I bought a ZRX eleven 1, hundred for seven hundred and fifty dollars. I'm we, shaking we my head, audience. I'm shaking my head. <laughs> I put about another grand into it in in parts and work. Um, elbow grease, yeah. Plus, yeah, plus tires, um, a couple a couple other things. But for the most part, it was all there. Uh, the bodywork was in good shape, and that's the thing I look at first: is the bodywork in in good shape? I could do mechanical work, but man, paint is very expensive to do correctly. Yes. Uh, not to mention sourcing decals. But I have a, a great running and riding ZRX for not a whole lot of money. When I am out of the motorcycle industry, one of the first things that I would think about doing is buying a brand new motorcycle. But for now, my my focus on that professionally and, and personally um, is spent with bikes that I need to be reviewing, right? We, we have the opportunity to test new sure. motorcycles and sure. my brand new motorcycle, if I bought one, would just keep getting older while I'm out riding other new motorcycles to write <laughs> stories. About. So um, right. for now, I've, I've been able to resist the siren call of the local dealership, but uh, they'll probably <laughs> see me around someday. So okay. I want to I want to bring this I want to bring it back around, Zach. I want to toss the same question over to you. But before we do that, uh, let's just take a quick break for a word from our sponsor, Motul. Okay, so we are back after a quick word from our sponsor, Motul. Um, Mr. Greaser has given us his answer for this, but Mr. Quartz, what's the worst motorcycle purchase that exists? So, I'm I'm still I'm still just stunned at that that, that Andy uh, stepped back with such grace. And reminded us that uh, we live in a society where we need to focus on other things aside from what we're doing on two wheels. Anyway, wow, I, my, the, what I was going to say uh, was basically, so what came to mind was sort of those, um, we've talked about this before, uh, Spurgeon, I think in the uh, in the Great American Motorcycling Blunders episode, the all those sort of, um, I don't know, like fat tire, hard tail stylized choppers from the early 2000s right um the sort of like uh um you know orange county chopper uh style of i don't know you know big front wheel raked out front end really glossy paint fat rear tire sns engine and they for were se- like for seventy five thousand dollars yeah exactly they were fifty eighty hundred thousand dollars right um you're talking about like a big dog chopper or something like that. Yeah, some you know uh, in the sort American, of Jesse James era, Ameri- uh, American Iron Horse, like the yeah boutique custom early two right. thousands. Exactly, and okay. it's not that I. It's not that the. I mean, they look uncomfortable and miserable to ride as well, frankly. But that's not the point. The point is, um, I think that that's you. Those bikes now are not worth anything. So, it, from an investment standpoint, from the sort of like a you know monetary standpoint, that's a that's a pretty bad purchase. But I think rather than focus on that type of motorcycle, I only wish to use it as an example of something that's a fad. That's sort of my answer here. Is a, what's the worst motorcycle purchase that exists? Something that is a flash in the pan. And I know that that's can be hard to 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 determine in the moment, but. Spurgeon's Cafe Racer dreams are are a little window into that. I think, yeah, but don't t- you? No, because here, here's the deal. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, but no, but no, no, but my 440 LTD, you guys, no, it was going to no, be the but talk I, of the block. Let no, me tell you. this one was would, different. If, no, if I would have bought a bike, like I would still like if if somebody had a, the the right like truly cafeed out or, or or retroed out motorcycle and it was running and I could just hop on and ride it. I would still ride that style of motorcycle. Okay. My my Fair. problem just came with my own ability to finish a job <laughs> yeah. when other shining objects shiny objects get in the way. <laughs> I see. I think the fad thing comes into play when coupled with Andy Greaser's financial advice, right? Like because if you went out and bought that chopper for fifty or sixty thousand dollars, and then five years later you can sell it for five or six thousand dollars, like that sucks. And that does happen. You do see that ebb yeah. and flow with certain motorcycles that that fall out of favor. 
Right. I think those. I think that's a that's a pretty extreme example, though. Like, I I, I don't know if I can think of another another type of bike. Oh, I mean, you could buy like a, you know, you could buy one of those Ducati Desmo Sedici, um, you know, uh, MotoGP replicas when it was new, it was seventy five thousand dollars new, and I don't think that they're going for that nowadays. But but they're still in the you 50s, know, it's, you know. But you still but, but you would have lost twenty. You still lost about twenty grand on it. You know? Yeah. And yeah, I, so I don't know, but 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 I don't think to Andy's point. I think that if you have the financial means to do that, then fine, take a take a financial loss on a bike because you like it. Who cares? Um, I think that I think that uh, the only the only true s- story that I can think of in my own personal life is I remember in like middle school or something like that. I had a friend who hyped up a uh, uh, paintball. Uh, like playing, like going, going, and and uh, and playing paintball. And nice. he was like, "You gotta get like we got you got to get a paintball gun. You got to get a mask. You got all this stuff. It's gonna be so awesome." And I sort of like fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. And I spent whatever it was like a lot of money for a for someone who was fourteen or twelve. I don't remember how old I yeah, was. Yeah, well, you can't you can't just start with whatever the base rental gun is that the oh. paintball place gives you you have to go out and buy a tip the 98 custom and get out <laughs> all there, right kid. all right reel it in I, there killer i didn't uh i didn't go nuts but whatever it was like 150 or 200 bucks or something like yeah, that of like lot. of like allowance or like whatever money i had saved which was a lot to spend and i used it like twice and then you know whatever it, i sold it on a and like my friend's parents yard sale five years later for 20 bucks or something it was just terrible and i think you can do that with motorcycles to a certain extent right like you could you could get into it sort of for the wrong reasons or or kind of like hype yourself up and then buy something and then not use it and i think that would arguably be a bad purchase it sounds to me like you're saying there's a difference between actually liking something and getting caught up in a fad and whether or not that fad becomes something of value down the line we don't know for sure what those uh, custom cruisers you were talking about are going to be worth someday. True. And it also doesn't, it doesn't really matter to us right now because what we're looking at more in your critique of, of purchases like this would be, did you just get caught up in the fad or did you actually like the motorcycle? And that might not be a realization that you have until after the bike is out of the garage or after right. some years have passed. But yeah. a, a fad is not... It's just lacking somehow compared to sure. having actually bought something that you wanted and liked. To to put a finer point on it, and this is this is hopefully I don't offend too many people, but when you saw or see someone, or you said when you saw past tense, when you saw someone in that era riding one of those choppers around, one of those you know uh, 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 theoretical seventy five thousand dollar fat tire big dog chopper, did. Were you under the impression that they liked the activity of motorcycling or were you under the impression that they liked the thing that they bought and sort of needed to show it off? Well, it was usually parked next to their boat and <laughs> okay. their, you know, uh, quads. And I, I felt like it was just, I, I feel like in a lot of cases, it was just another possession it was that an got item. brought out on a Sunday right. afternoon for an hour right. or two. Um, and so I'm sure are, that there were people that loved that stuff. I'm sure that, and, and sure. I, it goes back to like the, the current, the current real push is for like vintage choppers. And I know Patrick Garvin's, you know, big into a lot of that activity. And he talked about the, the Harley that he's building right now. But I think what we're seeing with that is that the, the spit polish and shine and gaudiness <laughs> of some of those, those right. eras has been right. replaced with some of the authenticity of original, you know, maybe a little bit more rough around the edges right. versions of those bikes. And and I should say we're generalizing here, and it's not to suggest that the lifestyle is BS. It, we, whatever whatever sort of motorcycling lifestyle you choose, but I, I think the fad is the is the thing, as Andy said, that that uh, that I would warn you. Just against. yeah, just one more clarifying question for your point here, Zach. <laughs> okay. So the fad and the flash and the uh, the treatment of this vehicle as a toy maybe, or as, right. as something that you just got caught up in that seems like a problem to you. But if someone were to buy a simple, robust, little utilitarian bike 
for running around town and maybe commuting to work, something that is not special at all. That doesn't fall into the same category though of, of being the worst because mm. it's just doing its thing. It's nothing special. It's just a little fuel sipper. But <laughs> even though there's not that uh, deep attachment to it uh, that, that may have come with the fad purchase, mm. the fad purchase would be worse when looked at as a whole because it didn't even end up providing the thing that you hoped it would to begin with, that the shine wears off, the new disappears, and you are looking at this saying, I, I made a, a, a bad decision. This is, this is <laughs> not what I wanted. This is not what I hoped to get out of this. Yeah. Maybe it's the difference between a tool and a toy. Yeah, there you know? it is. There I, it is. You got there. I, it's, I, it was I your know. idea after all. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so well, I, but, but I want to pivot to you, Spurge. Yeah, you, 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 guys, you have a chance to answer are, this question. No, you guys have gone deep down into the financial world. We of have. Like, yeah, Andy Greaser's, you know, over here talking about loan advice and Zach's telling about, you know, investment advice and really- No, no, it's not about investment advice. It's about, uh, it's yeah, about yeah, 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 yeah. judging your emotional landscape, I think. I, I want to talk more about like, you know, so the worst motorcycle to purchase is one that you are buying a motorcycle that outperforms your ability such that it becomes- uh, uh, dangerous. And this is actually something that I, I think I've seen a couple of comments come through on, on previous episodes about, right. well, maybe the motorcycle you shouldn't buy is the one that's too big for you or the one that's too powerful for you. And uh -huh. I, I think if looks don't match reality, you know, if you buy a bike to do one thing and it, and it doesn't do that well, it doesn't live up to it. We've talked about that, but really the example I want to give, and I've talked about this before in the podcast, and I want to bring it back around. Is a 1981 Kawasaki 440 enough, LTD. Enough, enough, no. It's, <laughs> I was working at the dealership, and there was a guy came in, and he referred to himself as the captain. He, and he had a longer explanation for it, but we'll save that story for another time. Uh -huh. So, And he talked in third person a lot, so it was the captain. The captain wants to buy a motorcycle. The captain okay. had a motorcycle when he was a kid, and he wants to ride again. And the captain <laughs> had dreams of glory and was going to buy a Goldwing. And he was going to buy a used Goldwing, which in this case uh, had even less approachability than a new Goldwing. A new Goldwing <laughs> has ABS, and it's got traction control, and it's a little bit lighter, and it's a little bit more nimble. The captain wanted a 1984 used gold wing that was sitting on, on the floor. And when I, I sold the captain the motorcycle, I voiced my concerns. I said, I don't think this is the right bike for you. I said, I, I think that we should probably maybe get you on something smaller. And you come back and trade it in on a used gold wing. And the right. captain said, no, I shall buy this motorcycle and I shall impress <laughs> Uh, he really wanted to just buy it to impress uh, girls. Other sailors. Yeah other, yeah. Other, yeah, other other sailors. The good right. ship Goldwing. Got on, <laughs> bought, bought, bought the bike, got on the bike, started the bike, took, like, wanted no advice, wanted no help, put the bike in gear, rode across four lanes of traffic and into the ditch on the other side of the road. Uh, <laughs> and uh, hurt not uh. only his, his new Goldwing, but he hurt his ego a little bit as well. Right, the cap it, He went down with the ship. Yeah, he did. the captain, the took, captain the, took right down in the right down in the straight dish. from parking lot to iceberg. So, I think there's a lesson there. And the captain, you know, got up, dusted himself off, and asked <laughs> one of us to ride the bike back to his house for him, which we did. We got the bike back to his house, and about six months later, the captain called us to come and pick the bike up and take it back to the shop so we could sell it for him. And he rode zero, maybe like five miles. Like he he might have put five miles on this bike. So the the, the the worst motorcycle purchase is one where you don't feel comfortable. You're not excited about it. You, you don't want to ride the bike. It's something that you feel intimidated by. It's not going to instill confidence in you. It's not going to allow you to go out there and do what you want to do. And for me, I want everyone to have a great experience on two wheels. I hate to hear the stories of like, oh, I got on my cousin's bike and I hit a tree and I never picked up a bike again because they're dangerous and they're scary. Motorcycles are, are fun and they, they can be safe. They can be enjoyable. <laughs> But you just have to you have to approach it from the right angle, and I think there's just too many people out there that let ego get involved, and mm -hmm. that yeah. is the worst motorcycle purchase that there is, in my humble opinion. That is easily one of the worst motorcycle purchases I have ever heard of. 
<laughs> but I mean, but yeah, think about it, like I agree. Even even yeah. if you have the money, like if you've got the money and the means, and you don't have to worry about Andy Greaser's finance financing program, and you don't have to worry about buying Zach's seventy five thousand dollar big dog choppers because seventy five thousand dollars is nothing to you. You can go out and buy the wrong motorcycle, and you can have a horrible experience. And right. even if you have all the time and the money in the world, you're not going to come back and continue doing motorcycle with all that time and that money because you, you're scared of it, and that sucks. So that's you could my you answer. could even say that's a great answer. I like it. I like that a lot. Yeah. I love that take. You you could even say if you have all the time and money in the world, you might be more susceptible to making the wrong motorcycle purchase oh. just because you have the mean. You know, maybe some people the 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 those riders out there who have to keep finances or or time management or uh you know like sort of other factors in mind are better off because they'll end up with something that makes a little bit more sense so andy like andy we started off this podcast i was i was filling the audience in on the fact that i had just done my first enduro race over the, the past weekend <laughs> and, and i talked to you about it already so we don't need to go down that road but i was having a conversation with with jeff about this and he said okay. really you see a lot of people that start off in the c class that are a little bit later in life because they're just beginning. A C, a C class, for those of you that are not familiar, is like the beginner class for this. Yeah, I don't know anything about Enduros. You got to talk down to me. What does that mean? A, a C, this the C class is like uh, is where I started. I, I'm, a, I'm a C class rider. I go in and I've not really done this before. I'm just figuring right. it out. And it's the, usually the largest group because it tends to be a lot of people that are maybe a little bit later in life. You know, into their into their 30s or 40s. They have got a job that's established. They've got a little bit of extra discretionary income, and they can afford to buy a, a dirt bike and go out and and, and ride it on the weekend or maybe when they were younger, they couldn't do that. And one of the things that we talked about was oftentimes, you know, people get in over their heads because they go out and they buy a brand new 300cc two-stroke KTM and they really don't need that. They should be on a 150 or they should be on a, a 250. Right. They should be on something that's a little bit more uh, approachable or they should be on a four-stroke or maybe something used. And they get in, they buy something big and fancy and new, and then they, they find themselves you know, in a situation where it's too much power and they, they're in it's, over their heads. So it's the Ducati Penegale at the, in the, in the slow group at the track day. Yes. When you're like, ah, not, not the right tool for the job. Yep. Yeah. Where and, they, where that person would do a lot better for themselves if they would have bought a used SV650 right, right. with all their yeah. money in the world and then dumped all their so, money in the world into training. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, there's some mindset that comes with it too, right? If you buy a fast and competitive machine, go ahead and run it in C-class. Go ahead and run it in whatever class is appropriate to your riding ability. But just because you bought a motorcycle that looks like the ones running in the upper classes, that doesn't mean that hopping on the bike is immediately going to make you ride at the same level as those riders. You could certainly get there, get that experience, get that bike out and work your way up through the ranks. But thinking that you can just buy your way into a class by having the right helmet and the right uh, the right motorcycle. That's not exactly how this works. And there are also people running in the C classes, uh, like you said, who may be uh, a little bit on the older side, or maybe they're just younger riders who want to experience this, but you can go there and just ride for completion. Not everybody at these events is <laughs> going for points and you don't necessarily need to earn points uh, to have a good time. This is the place to get those mistakes out, develop those skills and work your way on up. Uh, so you can certainly bring a high performance motorcycle like that to whatever class you feel comfortable in, but biting off more than you can chew is not fun for anyone. I think, I think, what did you just say? You just said, yeah, it was a great line. You said you don't need to score points to have a good time or something like that. I, I I just that that was that was in the midst of of uh, of what you just said. That's a, that's a that's a Revzilla T-shirt if I've ever heard one. You don't yeah. need point that that goes for whether you're whether you're it's going a to bike side, night, you're going to right attract there. it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Whether you're going to an enduro, whatever. You don't need to score points to have a good time. It's not necessarily what you're after. So Spurge, uh, I think I think we nix topic number four. We we had another little subtopic we were going to talk about, but I don't even think we need to. I well, think we can move on. To the I, end. Think, I think we can, so we, we can nix topic, topic three we've already touched on, right? So let's just, let's do a quick roundabout for topic four. Um, and, and everybody throws out one thing into the ring and then we move right <laughs> along to the end. Cause I think, I, I think there's going to be, I, I actually, I want to hear the answers to this. So, so that what we're alluding to listening audience, topic number four is bad purchases that are non motorcycle. So what's something motorcycle adjacent that you have bought that has been 
a mm. bad purchase or the mm -hmm. wrong, maybe the wrong purchase. Andy, guest honors, what's something motorcycle adjacent that you have bought that you weren't happy with? So just to be clear, this is this is not a motorcycle, but it could be a motorcycle part or a part, yeah. piece, Tool. Of, piece of gear. gear. Okay, yes. sure. Okay. Exactly, and, exactly. And does this need to be something that I purchased or can it just be a thing in general? It can because be a thing got, in general because you oh, were savvy got, enough to know not to purchase but it. If you, <laughs> yeah, yes. oh, I've got one I want to talk about. Go for it. <laughs> the motorcycle purchase that just drives me crazy when people it's when people buy color matched accessories for their bikes that don't match like an anodized <laughs> bolt kit or like a windshield or the color coordinated brake hoses look at the rage in his eyes so I for love, those of you those of you I listening, love how specific this is yeah you, those of you it's listening awesome. to the podcast andy greaser has fire in his eyes <laughs> uh, so you you go to your local bike night whatever and you roll up to somebody's zx10 my guy you have 17 different shades of green on this motorcycle and it's <laughs> making my eyes go crossed <laughs> It doesn't I look love that. better. It doesn't improve the motorcycle functionally. It doesn't improve <laughs> performance. It just looks worse. I understand the desire to, to personalize your bike. I understand that <laughs> these parts are available and can be made to look good, but just shotgun replacing every piece <laughs> on the bike that you can find with anything that looks anywhere close to another color that you want to match while completely missing any sense of cohesion with it, it's it just looks rough. And then I have to take all those parts off when I eventually end up with the bike and I have to rebuild it for myself. <laughs> right. And you have to lowball them when you buy it from them because you're like, I don't want these stupid green brake lines. Uh, I, I'll, I'll I, take them off and leave them in your driveway. <laughs> I think I think <laughs> I think Farkles in general is a great one, Andy. Like whether they're mismatched color Farkles, like I know when I bought my 890 Rally. Uh, there was a ton of stuff I just took off the bike because I didn't want it. And I just, I sold it. I was like, I don't want any of this stuff. I just want to go back to basics. So I think, I think Farkles in general is a really great one that oftentimes, uh, if it, if, unless you're buying a bike where you <laughs> and the owner have the exact same taste, chances are you're going to end up stripping a bunch of stuff off of there. So I like that one mm. a lot. Exactly. What about you, Spurge? No, no, oh, going to you, turn? buddy. Yeah. What do you got? What, what's the non-motorcycle, motorcycle adjacent thing that has been a bad purchase or would be a bad purchase? Oh, I don't, I, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a great answer. I love how specific <laughs> Andy's was. Um, uh, I, I, uh, so we, we, we have a, we have a, an idea for a podcast later in the season to talk about dissecting the difference between cheap gear and expensive gear and sort of like have a little bit more in-depth conversation about what it means, um, to you know what the different types of armor mean and what the different types of helmet are and that kind of thing um you know what pops to mind first of all is like a like you see someone riding a pretty nice bike and they clearly have like a 20 year old helmet on or just like a really old like they're sort of skimping on things that are that are important or like uh someone who has expensive gear on but they have worn out tires or they, or the, mm. or the like old tires. They're like, basically they're skimping on things that are important. Like, you know, by protecting your brain or, or, or protecting your, a the, the, like a the rusty, a rusty chain on a new bike. Oh, I, right. I, I hate so it. I, I know that's, that's not really like a bad purchase, but it's sort no, of like, it, it's a, it's a, it's a misallocation of funds and energy in, in a way that purchasing to the wrong priorities. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Um, so I don't want to get into the gear thing because we're going to talk about that uh, another time, hopefully. Um, but that's sort of what pops into my head. Then again, the counterpoint to that uh, is, you know, I, I I know people who are sort of like, you know, uh, geezers that are like, hey, you know, if you're wearing a helmet, it's something. It's not, you know, it could be a helmet better than no helmet, even if it's even if it's crummy. But you know, you got a twenty thousand dollar bike and a and like a hundred dollar helmet, and I'm kind of like, I don't, I don't know. It's not, it's not that it's wrong. It just sort of like. It gives me a little bit of the fingernails on a chalkboard where I'm like, ah, don't do that. I don't know. Yeah, I think I, I my answer is not very good. No, I, I like I like what you said about the tires. I, I think the tires, the chain, I think helmet, especially you know, knowing that the the, the safety of a helmet after five to seven years, a helmet's not going to really protect you anymore. Um, you know, they are a wear item, and we can get into that more in depth. But I think I think it's a good one. Uh, mine is more specific, and Let's it is it. a very specific product for a motorcycle. And it's not that it doesn't work for everybody. I know some people have these on their bikes and they love them. It's a product called a Steg Peg. 
Do either of you know what a steg peg is? No, I thought you were going to say it's gremlin bells. Don't, I've, I, never, you know, I've never I, had any luck with them. Honestly, honestly, Andy, like what a stupid <laughs> purchase, but I'm sure that there's so many people in our audience that like love that <laughs> that like I'm not about to even go there. So yeah, I'm, I'm, you and I are on the same page, Andy, but I'm not, I'm not going down that road. Zach, what were you going to say? You know what a steg peg is? I don't know what a steg peg is. I thought you were going to say... I thought you were going to say like uh, an exhaust or a helmet mohawk or something very specific like that, but I don't know what a steg peg is. It, uh, okay. So this is actually me. like, those are all, I would put that in Andy's bucket of farkles, right? If you're putting a mohawk on your helmet, like right. God, God help you. But <laughs> what I will say is that a steg peg is actually a pretty functional uh, part that you add into uh, onto your motorcycle. If you're riding off road, it's for adventure bikes and dual sports. And it's like a, it's like a, a flat piece of metal with a little puck on the side, and then the puck is adjustable. And the idea here is that it helps you kind of adjust um, your feet and give your feet something to lock into. So when you're riding aggressively, your feet can lock in and they don't slip off the pegs because it, it allows you to have this little puck that your boots kind of lock into. I thought Sounds dangerous. I wanted this. Well, it's 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 not. It doesn't stick out so far that your feet okay. get stuck. It's okay. that you can you can in theory your your boots can come off of it if you if you're getting okay. into trouble but if you're riding fast it helps to give you something to grip onto so you, you braced against it bingo right okay. okay so i thought i wanted this i got a set when i bought my 1090 i got a set it's the only part that i have ever put on and then subsequently in the i did it for the pine barrens 500 which is a three-day adventure ride i made it about two hours into the <laughs> the day on day one and I pulled over and I took them off in the middle of the event. I, I hated them because I found, to, to Zach's point, I was locked in one place to the point where it was dangerous. I couldn't get my feet off to dab. I, I right. felt like I was stuck. I couldn't get back far enough. And it's the one accessory that I added from a functionality standpoint where I really thought I was going to like them. And I did not. And I've later come to learn that it is a very uh, divisive modification. People either love them or they hate right. them. I right. fall into the camp of the latter. <laughs> well, if that doesn't sum up some uh, some bad motorcycle purchases, I don't know what does. I think we're I think I think we've I think we've covered it. And I just you know me, Spurge, I can't wait to get into that engine guessing game. I think it is time <laughs> for us, Andy Greaser. Do you feel like you are prepared to play? Are you the ready to enter Thunderdome guessing game? Yes, yes. <laughs> nice. Let's right. do it. So, Zach, give, right. the, give the 30-second synopsis to the audience as to what we're about to do. So, what you're going to hear right now, uh, audience, you can play along at home. You're going to hear a motorcycle engine starting up, idling, revving a few times, we think, and then turning off. And the goal is to try to guess the make, model, uh, and potentially modifications that this motorcycle has. None of us, uh, Spurgeon, myself, Andy, have heard this engine sound before this was sourced by our, our lovely producer chase and uh so yeah the the time has come we listen to the engine sound and we try to guess so Everybody, we're all playing along in real time along. and you the know. listener are yeah. playing along as well so without any further ado <laughs> let's all take a few seconds here and let's listen to this week's sound This is a uh, this is a this is a tricky one. What are you guys hearing? What to talk, Single- uh, guest honors, Greaser. What are you what are you hearing first, right out of the gate? Uh, I th- I think it's an engine swapped Grom, but I don't know what engine they swapped in. <laughs> That's very specific. <laughs> you surely yeah. you, you're you're kidding a little bit. Yes, of course. I I think <laughs> we've got some sort of V twin action okay. happening here. Um, really, you don't or, think you don't you don't think it's a single cylinder? No, uh, it, it's too syncopated for that. But I probably will be proven wrong as soon as the identity of this thing is revealed. No, it's not. A, it's not a single. I don't think it can be a single. I think it's a parallel twin. You think it's P twin? Yeah, but, but it's like it's. It does it sound? It doesn't sound like a one eighty crank parallel twin. You know, it might be a three sixty crank. 
parallel twin. You don't think so, Spurge? I don't, I don't think so. That doesn't sound like my Bonneville. My Bonneville was a 360 crank. Yeah, that's true. It's a. It's I definitely would, like a lighter crankshaft if it's than a, that, right? If it's a P twin, I think it might be a 270. Yeah, it could crank. be because it could. It kind of sounds like a V twin, right? Yeah. But it has a. Let's sounds, think about how how were they revving it, right? It's, it didn't. It, it's it didn't very go, raspy. It sounds it didn't go cheap. terribly. It didn't go terribly high. <laughs> but the flywheel's pretty light, right? All right. Like do, we want, rev, do we want to clue? Pretty quickly. Do you want to clue? Let's give. All right. So this is. I, I think. I think this, we need a hint. Yeah. I, hint, I don't know. Hint number one. Relatively low production motorcycle. <laughs> okay. So it's rare, which. That that's re, what's the what's the what's the phrasing of the hint again exactly? Relatively Relative. low production motorcycle. Okay, but it sounds like we are still expected to know what this is. It's not that <laughs> it's not that low production. Well, hint, right. hint number hint number it's two because it goes okay. it goes hand in hand. Hint number two is never sold in the United States. Oh, geez, Louise. Terrific. So this is a low production motorcycle that has never been sold in the United States. So I'm going to listen one more time because I think I'm going to change my answer. Yeah. <laughs> can we can we hear that again? Go ahead and play uh, it. Mine won't play. I got to refresh. <laughs> I'm, gonna sold I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna change my answer. What's your answer? You never had an answer to begin with. I no no. I mean, but my my guess was a single. Then it was like okay, well we're trying to go through parallel twins. I think it's a little Honda VFR 400. No. Was that a V4? Yeah. No. Or a, you mean a VTR or a VFR? Whatever the little VT... The, no, the VFR. The, the little four... Was wasn't, it... Wasn't it was the, a 400cc V4? I think that... Are you talking the, about... You're talking about an NC30, maybe. No. No, i So I'm, I'm also... It's not a V4. Too. I'm looking to change my answer. I would say V4 is definitely out. I'm no longer convinced that it's a V twin, but it is. It sounds like it's it's small. It's two cylinders, and I'm I'm hearing some valve train noises. I, I think it's kind of Honda made a VFR 400 for the Japanese only <laughs> market. I'm right. Like I'm. That's my okay. guess. A 399 cc V4. Uh, that's that's my guess. That's awesome. You're definitely wrong. But that's okay. that's an awesome that's an, that, yeah. that's an awesome awesome bike. I don't or think I can tough. I don't think I can follow you where you're going there, but I <laughs> would love to hear one of those bikes in person. Um, never sold in the United States. Never sold. I mean, I appreciate that Spurge is thinking outside the US market here. We're we're drag we're dragging it out a lot here. I, I need to come up with a guess. Here, right, a guess. Here, go ahead. Uh, uh, my guess is a I don't. I don't know. I, I literally can't think of a of a bike that like I have to name a bike that wasn't sold here. That's like kind of hard to do to begin with, especially yeah. like what's something they sold. In, what's a little parallel twin they sold in Europe, Andy, or like a like a a, a and it doesn't even have to be little. A parallel yeah. twin. I think it might be something adjacent to the a VTR two hundred and fifty or something like that. So I was wrong. Here's hint number three. Hint number three for you two, and this is the final hint, and I, I still don't know what the answer is, but as soon as I read hint number three, I realized I'm out. Uh, parallel twin with a 315 degree crankshaft. Ah, oh, there okay. we go. That's so just... I, was, I was here. I wasn't a 360 crank, but I was close. 315. There are people screaming into their exactly <laughs> into their cars while they're listening to our podcast commuting. Like, there's only one that has a 315 crank in it. How could you not get this? I don't any, think any I don't think final I know. guesses. I don't think I know what the the 315 crank. I I don't know, but I, I maintain. Wait, it, so what was the? Oh, I have a parallel twin. Okay, so I was right about the parallel twin, and I was right about the crank to a certain extent, but I don't know what the bike is. What is it? Yeah, the, yeah, that's gonna, like hold on, hold there's, on. There's almost only counts in horseshoes and hand grenades. Zach, you're a loser today, my friend. Uh, <laughs> Andy, any guess for you? I think it's a Honda Transalp. Ooh, well, you are wrong. <laughs> and that's nothing new for you, Andy. This isn't going to you know, ruin your life. You've been wrong before. You'll be wrong again. But today, you are a loser on the high side, low side <laughs> engine guessing game. This is, in fact, a bone stock 2012 Husqvarna Nuda 
900 R. Wow. Never even so, knew that bike. Yeah. I don't know what that is. I have to, I have to I, look up a picture because I don't know what I, that is. I know what the Nuda is. And I, it's funny because I went the ver- when it very first started up, before it revved, I, I was thinking, well, I wonder if that's a, a BMW, like BMW F850 270 twin or a BMW F800 uh, um, 360 crank parallel twin. And it's important But then they revved it and I was like, there's no way that's not right. That's not right. But oddly, I was, I was sort of on the right track there so it's it's interesting so a couple notes here um this was this was during the era that bmw owned husqvarna so husqvarna is currently owned by ktm but uh this bike was sourced from tom in south australia so thank you to tom for shooting us an email you are going to get a t-shirt um, remember if you if you have an engine sound uh we want you to send that in tom is our winner today only made for two years, 2012 and 2013, <laughs> while Husky was owned by BMW. This bike was discontinued when KTM acquired the Husqvarna brand. The engine is based on the BMW F800 engine uh, with a 100cc capacity increase and a 315-degree crankshaft. So wow. thank you, Tom, Whew. for educating us on the 2012 wow. Husky Nuda 900R. This has been a tremendous guessing game once again. Remember, if you are going to send us an engine sound, it needs to be about 30 seconds long. Give us the bike at idle. Give us a couple of good revs, and then let it idle once again. Um, Zach, anything else for you before we round up our episode here? We have to go on and do comments, and we've got to do our T-shirt winner for the day for the review. But Mm. if we've got nothing else for young Andy Greaser here, I think we can cut him loose into the wild. Well, I would just like to say uh, uh, nine out of ten, Andy, for your high side, low side debut. Thanks so much for hanging out. It was a treat. I appreciate all your stories, and I hope we can have you on again sometime. Go well, study you. some engine sounds, and maybe you can come back a winner. <laughs> yeah, <'Cause> that's, <laughs> I think that's where Zach knocked a point off for me. Exactly. That's one hundred percent true. You didn't get the engine away sound from this yep. uh, new to nine hundred R, but uh, not a mistake. I'll be making again, Tom. Thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> All right, Andy. Thanks for hanging out, man. We'll see you soon. See you, bye. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Andy Greaser is back to writing more stories for Common Tread, presumably, <laughs> the rest of his day. But that was fun, though. I had, uh, had a good time talking to Andy. Do you, uh, would you say, it's a, now that he's gone, would you say it's a success? Spurs? I always enjoy talking to Andy. But I will say <laughs> that, uh, I mean, that was a heck of a guessing game for the for the Rev Trivia this time around. Oof, um, I, I think that's probably, that was probably the hardest one that we've done yet this season. And, you know, Andy Greaser wasn't the only loser. I was a loser. You were a loser. <laughs> we're all losers today. So, well, I no, appreciate that, that you would. You at least named a bike that wasn't sold here. I just said like, oh, I think it's a parallel twin, and it's, I think the crank is blah blah blah. And then you were like, name a bike, and I was like, I can't. I don't know any. So anyway, I um, I hate losing, but I do love that game. Um, so and I hope now, you had fun with that. Everybody. Our, our high side, low side listening audience knows what a Husqvarna Nuda 900R is, and they right. also know that a VFR 400 <laughs> was a bike that existed in Japan. <laughs> True. Fair enough. All right. So we're moving on to the t-shirt winner. Uh, Friendly Runner, you can win a t-shirt if you leave an Apple podcast review. uh, And it, for some reason, inspires us in some way. We appreciate all the Apple podcast reviews. Helps keep high side, low side relevant. And uh, who's the winner this time around, Spurge? The winner today is Blade Jester Zero, who Mm. wrote in and said, hey, guys. I had to steal my mom's iPad (laughs) to write this review (laughs) in hopes that I could get a free t-shirt. I'm looking to upgrade to a mid-sized bike here soon and would love to get y'all's opinion on this. Uh, I have repeatedly listened to all of you for over a year. Love the show. Hope it's going to go on for a long time. I have to make this fast because my mom does not allow anyone, in all caps, to use her iPad ever. Uh, So this is a golden rule in our household. So I need to get off of here. Have a good day and an awesome show. Um, So Blade Jester Zero, for the (laughs) risk-reward factor of you stealing your mother's iPad, you get a free T-shirt. And, um, you know, I I think it's interesting because, you know, Blade Jester wants to get some opinions on uh, upgrading a motorcycle. So Blade Jester Zero, do a couple things. Send us an email uh, with your address and your shirt size to highsidelowside at revzilla.com. And if you've got some specific questions on what bikes you want to upgrade to, Throw them in that email as well, and maybe we'll pick your email for a future episode. And for all of you listening, 
Whether it's for a free t-shirt or not, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does help to generate interest around the show, and it helps to get the podcast noticed by more people. Mm. I love. I remember that review now. I hadn't remembered when we dove into it, but that's fantastic. I love that someone's out there riding a motorcycle around, um, which is generally agreed upon to be a risky uh, uh, hobby or a pastime. And uh, and yet the high side low side review was taking my mom's iPad and being like, "You guys, this is dicey. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm hoping to survive this." Anyway, um, moving on. Mom, to- mom clearly rules with an iron fist in that household. So uh, true. Nothing true, true. wrong with so, that. So moving on to high side low side comments. Um, the first one comes in from Jeff V email. Um, I like to think, by the way that there are multiple people named Jeff who have sent emails with questions. And at this point, every Jeff listening is thinking, I wonder if it's mine. (laughs) Anyway, uh, Jeff drum roll. What this particular Jeff said was, I love your podcast and learn a lot in each episode. However, I am not an ADV rider or adventure touring rider. I bought a Harley ultra classic for those of you who don't know ultra classic. That is a top box batwing fairing, um, uh, Harley grand touring bike, uh, made for, Made for going down long the highway for long periods of time. Yeah. And comfort. Uh, Jeff says the heavy bike has lots of comfort and storage. Uh, it's perfect for distance riding. My question is I see big touring bikes all over. Uh, they're obviously popular. I get that they're old people bikes, and neither of you are technically, or you know, particularly old. Thank you, Jeff, for the compliment. Appreciate that. Um, and he points out that we sometimes say we don't like technology, we don't like radios, we don't like nav, we don't like electronics, blah, blah, blah. Um, Jeff basically says, uh, why not, why not talk about, uh, what, you know, why don't you talk about big bikes? And he says, he, I've got a Grom. He's got a little bike also. He's got all different types of bikes. It's not that he's not a, a, a um, it's not that his enthusiasm is not widespread across the two wheeled world, but Jeff is sort of asking, why don't we, why don't we talk about, why don't we talk about those big bikes more? Spurgeon? Why is it? Why is that Zach? No, no, Spurgeon, you could, you got no, to answer Zach, that one. Why, no, why no, no, I no, no, Zach, no, no, I, please, I read I, the question. I, I could never take this away from you. Uh, it was funny. So we talked about this. In pre- <laughs> we talked about this in pre-production, and it's just like, it's it's not what Zach and I gravitate towards, and there's nothing wrong with them, right? And I think we've gotten the point <laughs> in our maturity that we can simply say that, you know, if I want to go out and tour on a motorcycle, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for something a little bit more lighter and more nimble, and probably a little bit on the sportier side or the more off-roady side of what touring is. And, and I think that that's okay. Right. And, and it sounds like Jeff's idea of touring is comfort and stability. But what I will say, and I and I want to be very clear on this because I'm <laughs> I'm looking right in the camera at my father, and and I've made a couple comments so far this season that has gotten me in trouble around the dinner table during family functions. But I don't think these are old people bikes because they weigh like 900 pounds. And dad, I love you, but your knees are bad. And lifting up a 900 pound motorcycle off of a side stand isn't an endeavor that I think is really going to lead to instilling confidence in riding. And I'm using my father as an example. I'm throwing him under the bus because I love him. But also I think there's a lot of people out there in his right. shoes. And I think my dad has slowly come around to the fact that like he, he likes having my Bonneville in the garage. He likes something that looks kind of cool and retro but it also is lighter and more nimble. And I think... As I th- as people get older, having big, heavy, uh, you know, unmanageable bikes becomes exactly what we were talking about with the captain, who the took captain. A gold wing into a right. gully, right? Like it's a bike right. that's big and unwieldy and man and unmanageable and hard to use. And I, I think that if people are gonna, you know, get to a certain point in their career, they they might want to think about downsizing. So I so, would say that an ultra classic is a middle age motorcycle, <laughs> where Zach and I are Zach and I are on the cusp of middle age. So maybe, maybe Jeff, you talk to us in a couple of years and we're going to be all ultra classic <laughs> out. So I think to, to jokes aside, Spurgeon, Spurgeon does point out that we have some institutional trouble with discussing these bikes. I would like to say that uh, a few years ago, um, I got my hands on an Indian Roadmaster, which is a, the Indian motorcycle version of a Harley ultra classic. And I did a four day camping trip to, to Zion, to the grand Canyon, um, with my, uh, now wife and we had a great time and it was fun. It was a cool bike to do that with. We held lots of luggage and, and it, and it delivered us to, uh, an adventure that we, that we won't forget. And that's great. But it feels to me, the analogy I would use is that those bikes are kind of the station wagons of the, motorcycling world they're the they're the sort of like 
wood trimmed Chevy Caprice station wagon of the eighties of the motorcycling world. And, and the, the ADV bikes are the SUVs of the motorcycling world that they can both go long distances, but ADV bikes can also do other stuff. And I think if you asked me, am I going to be more comfortable on a Harley ultra classic or on uh, a Harley Pan America for that matter? I'd, I'd take a Pan America. I'd take the engine with more horsepower. I'd take the riding position that I like better. I'd take the opportunity to trundle down a dirt road and feel more confident on the bike. And I would have less wind protection and I wouldn't have a stereo on the bike. And, you know, you do give some stuff up, but it's not in a way that I feel like affects the delivery of adventure that I mentioned before. So those of you listening, the look on my face is a bit puzzled because I don't think that that's <laughs> fair to station. Doesn't... I don't think it's fair to station wagons. Um, I was trying to figure out a, a, a like an automobile that I felt was more of an analogy because I well I enjoy, to... I enjoy a good station wagon, man. Like a... well, okay, but but more. The... <laughs> I appreciate that. I think if I was going to poke a hole in what I said, Jeff points out that those bikes are very popular and yeah. station wagons are not as popular anymore. Um, be, uh, be because of SUVs. So I think my analogy works in some ways, but not in others. The the point is. I, I think we 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 have a slightly more modern mindset on on touring, and it involves bikes that, in our view, are not less comfortable but can do other things. Um, yeah. and I it, and we we don't have a lot to say about those bikes that people don't already know, which is that they're big and they're heavy and they're comfortable. And and for what it's worth, please don't misunderstand Zach and I, because um, <laughs> I, I think we get we get letters and emails and comments sometimes that people feel like we hate certain things and and we don't it's just <laughs> like for our personal tastes we we're, would rather do the things haters. like I, I i've done i've done trips around southern california on a, on a street glide i did a one particular trip out in nevada on a street glide special I, i've talked before about a, a road king ride that i did down in texas which somebody made a comment about but it was actually recently <laughs> rerun over on jmp cycles common tread and they've all been fun times i, I would you know i wouldn't give them up but there were points in all of those trips where, like when I was riding Angeles Crest Highway on a street glide, I was like, huh, I'd rather be on something else. Like, right. right. It, so what I right. think the bottom line is, Jeff, we are raising our hand and saying, you're, you're right. We don't talk about these things. And maybe we don't have a good reason aside from implicit bias. And uh, it may be that we that we uh, take a hard left turn and, and actually uh, dedicate an episode to bikes like that at some point. Because like Spurgeon said, we've had good times on them. Um, so we, I, I, and, well, I'm trying to sum it up here. I appreciate that you called this out, Jeff. We don't have a good answer for you, but we will consider it, by gosh. But in the vein of touring <laughs> motorcycles, we've got another comment for you. And this is from Dwight, who wrote in and said... I uh, know, this is from... I think this is from Andy Are we in skipping? Indonesia. Are we skipping? I think so, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Our producer, Chase, didn't put these comments in the correct order. Good and, job, and, Zach. And we'll Spurge, give him a tongue lashing later. And yes. Spurgeon is Spurgeon is like Ron Burgundy. He will read whatever's on the prompter, everybody. You put so. it in front of me, and I'm just going to say it. So... <laughs> Andy from Indone or from Indiana wrote in, not Indonesia. Andy from Indiana wrote in and said, "I am normally a really big fan of the show. However, I'm extremely offended. I'm extremely offended that you talked for over an hour on sport touring motorcycles, season four, episode ten, and not one time did you mention an Indian FTR." especially the 2022 or newer <laughs> version with the 17 inch wheels it's and this is i quote from andy the best sport touring machine that has ever been made what's indian, wrong with you an are indian you on american okay. thanks for making decent okay. motorcycle content for me to listen to i enjoy most of it okay In, uh, the best sport touring motorcycle <laughs> ever made zach what do you think well, I think Andy is wrong that the Indian FTR is not the best sport touring motorcycle ever made. If you've been but, extremely offended by us in the past, Andy, buckle in because <laughs> buckle we're going to blow up. your mind. Buckle up, Andy. Um, I think Andy said this with a with a tinge of irony. I like to think so. Um, but uh, but I think this really interestingly 
Okay, so first of all, no. The FTR is not the best sport touring motorcycle ever made. It's not even a particularly good sport touring motorcycle because it doesn't have any wind protection and it has like 110 mile range and it doesn't have particularly good suspension or passenger accommodations or luggage options. But aside from that, <laughs> um, aside, I think, aside from that, how was the play, Mrs. Lincoln? Exactly. Um, I think it's interesting, though, the reason that we combined this email from Andy with the one from Jeff is that this is a this is these are two different sides of the coin in some ways. Right. Because Andy uh, sees an FTR. 1200 Indian FTR, uh, which is a sort of naked Ducati monster looking thing, um, as a sport touring bike because it has cruise control and um, and it has cruise control and it's and on the, it's on the sporty side of sport touring. It's a, it's right, a fun right. it's and, a fun naked sport and, bike uh-huh, and it has cruise control. So he, there are some things that that Andy sees on this bike and sees it as a as a touring bike. And it's not that you can't ride an Indian FTR as a sport touring bike or a touring bike, because any bike is a touring bike. If you try hard enough, as we've said many times on high side, low side, but this is part of the, the, the thinking part of the sort of lexicon of thought in motorcycling these days. And I think that's why people like Spurgeon and myself are less inclined to talk about big classic American V twin touring bikes, because we have a little, a little bit, a little sprinkle of what Andy's got in his brain, which is that why not this bike to go sport touring? Even though, as Spurgeon pointed out, Andy is very wrong. Well, here's the deal. Andy, <laughs> I, I don't agree with you. I don't think the FTR 1200 is a sport touring bike. I don't think it has any space in a, a conversation that we had about sport touring bikes. Um, however, and this is where hopefully I can take back some of the extreme offense that I've caused you in your, your life, Andy, and you can sleep well after you listen to this podcast— if I had to choose personally, and this is my my personal, and, and if you disagree with me, shoot us an email, send us a message. Maybe we'll read yours and, you know, we can have a discussion about it in the, in the future. But if I had to choose between a sport touring trip on uh, an Ultra Classic or an FTR 1200, my stupid brain would probably mm-hmm. go with an FTR 1200. Okay, I'd probably, I'd so probably maybe try and, not I'd probably that, okay. try and do that. Um, but if it, it depends on, like, am I, am I taking a trip across... Nebraska, or am I taking a trip through the mountains of North Carolina? Because that that would play a role. So I think there's sure. a form and a function here too. And and I think, you know, maybe Andy's writing in, and Andy's writing in from Indiana. I don't know. Are there hills in Indiana? Is there a lot of back roads that you can burn down? I, I don't, I've only ridden across the highway in Indiana, but I would imagine there's some some fun roads <laughs> out there to ride. And maybe maybe Jeff is coming to us from Oklahoma, where the wind goes blowing gently across the plains and it's a Okey straight dokey. line you know all right i think we could maybe move on to the to the final <coughs> high side low side comment everybody <laughs> um and uh this actually we're going to give away yet another t-shirt because spurgeon dunbar in the previous episode mentioned in passing impulsive man that he is that if someone could name the year i believe that mm-hmm. common tread was founded uh that he would send them a t-shirt um and it was from episode one of season oh, six. Oh, from episode one. Excuse oh, me. Episode okay. one of, yeah, not from season six. Episode one. Uh, yeah. So um, basically Spurgeon said, if you can was tell us one? when Common Tread was Sorry, found, hold on, hold on, I will hold on. send you. Episode one of season six. Is that correct? Sorry. I just want to, our, our producer Chase is, is, is trying to give me the correct information. I'm wrong. Episode one, season six. Go, Zach. Sorry. At some point during this season, Spurgeon mentioned that if you could name when Common Tread was founded, he would send you a t-shirt. And Dwight sent in an email that says Lance the Silver Fox Oliver was the founding member in 2014 after initially speaking with Anthony, Revzilla founder, about the new content idea. I remember Spurgeon's interview with Lance specifically covering this. Um, And uh, he mentions uh, one of the favorite parts of the article with Lance um, was a picture of Lance holding a sign that said, we'll cover racing for food, <laughs> since Lance is such a big racing fan. So, Dwight, you have an excellent memory, and Spurgeon, correct me if I'm wrong, Dwight is correct. Dwight is correct. So, uh, if you go back to, to listen to this that I threw out there, if you go to Common Tread and cycle all the way back to the very first article date that's on there, it actually goes back to 2013, because there were some landing page pieces that Lemmy and I were building out that existed before Common Tread was founded. Once Common Tread was founded, 
then we we kind of bubbled those pieces up under articles. But he is correct, Dwight. Uh, we we founded Common Tread in 2014. Everything you talked about, the Silver Fox, is absolutely correct. And that picture uh, of Lance holding holding the sign that says "We will cover racing for food" is one that I snapped of him uh, in the Philadelphia office when he was down here on a visit from his home in Ohio. Lance has sen- has since moved to Boston, where he now resides, and he will be back again covering racing nonetheless in September for the Moto America wrap up in New Jersey Motorsports Park. All right. Everybody, thanks for your for your your comments, your questions. Hope you uh, learned a thing or two on this episode of High Side Low Side. Now comes the time where we remind you to leave a comment below if you're watching on YouTube. Send us an email to highsidelowside at revzilla.com if you are listening to the podcast and have a question or comment. Send us your engine sounds, approximately 20 to 30 seconds of the bike starting up, idling, revving, and shutting off, along with information of the year make and model or modifications that have been made so that we can use it in our engine guessing game. And if we do, we will send you a t-shirt just as we will do if you leave an Apple podcast that makes us laugh. So in closing, the Mm. one thing I've learned today is that there are avid listeners and readers like Dwight that have been following along (laughs) for quite a long time. Dwight says that he's been a common tread reader since 2016. I'll throw out another random little quiz here for you people. And the only way you'll know this, the <laughs> only way you will know this, I believe, because I don't think I talked about it in my interview with Lance, is you, if you've been reading Common Tread since 2014. Are you going to give away another t-shirt right now? Yeah, why not? I'm, okay. We're just giving away t-shirts willy-nilly. Spurgeon's drunk with t-shirts. I'm not paying for this. Um, That's true. <laughs> what, was the, what was Common Tread called originally? Before it was called oh. Common Tread, the Common Tread online magazine slash blog that lives on revzilla.com had a different name and it had a different name for quite a while before it was switched over uh at the end of 2014 i believe um, right to common tread so what was really? that name and if you know shoot us an email to highside lowside at revzilla.com and we'll get you a t-shirt all right well, what did you yeah. learn zach yeah to wrap it up here gosh well, I learned that Spurgeon Dunbar can get the red mist when it comes to racing. That's uh, that's a whole other podcast in itself. That's going to be a fun I learned that one. about like myself, it. too. I did not know you that did. either. That's yeah. fun. I also learned um, via producer Chase not long ago, Spurge, you're going to feel silly. But you know what I just learned about this podcast? What? Today's Andy Greaser's birthday. <laughs> what? And we didn't wish him happy birthday? We are just the worst, aren't we? Oh. All right. So everybody sing happy birthday silently to yourself if you have to or out loud in your car if you're listening. Give happy Andy Greaser some good Happy birthday vi- <laughs> to you. That's oh. all you get, Andy. That's all you get. I'll all give you right, I'll give you well, that if, though. Andy, if you listen to this whole podcast of yourself and us, you will know that we are apologizing profusely for missing We'll your send birthday. you God, a t-shirt for are. your birthday. So Andy, you shoot Andy us an Greaser. email with your uh, high side, low side t-shirt information address and we'll send you a t-shirt. Uh, all right, everybody. With that bombshell of a of a of a faux pas from Spurgeon and myself, we can let you go. Thanks so much for hanging out. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, so when he said he was twenty nine years old, he turned twenty nine today. Perhaps <laughs> and he didn't even <laughs> he didn't mention, mention it. That? That's wait, not on us. That's on Andy. Andy <laughs> should have informed us. Oh, oh. my god. Well, anyway, all right. Well, hopefully you enjoyed the shenanigans as always. Um, Andy Greaser made for a tremendous high side, low side debut. Mm. Best part of my week is being here with you, Zach, and you, the high side, low side audience. So for uh, another, you know, trip down podcasting lane, thank you for joining us and we will see you next time. Later, everybody. Later, everybody.